3. A slice of freedom. 103. Moving again to London. Yes, it was hard and lonely to get on with life despite that huge knock. Perhaps life is meant to test you, throwing in your way hard emotional knocks, and you just need to spring back like a rubber ball. How else can one cope? My experience is that most people cannot deal with other people's trauma. One's trauma is one's own and should not be mentioned unnecessarily to off airs. I am reminded of that song by Peter Gabriel, which runs, Don't Give Up. I believe in that. Having completed my one-year course, I was sad to leave Oxford and my idyllic life in Pollock House. On my return to Bombay, I felt that there was a need for disabled people to socially interact with the so-called normal people. I believe that though we all have our own problems, we must make an effort to succeed with our fellow human beings. Perhaps disabled people have to make more of an effort, who knows. I believe that nobody is perfect, we are all in some way or the other disabled. Our disability is more visible, others have what I like to call an invisible disability. I went back to the recreational club that Zubin and I had started and began working diligently. I got a job in Bombay's Times for a short period. The attitude of the editor and my colleagues was great, but they did not think about accessibility. One little finger. 104. Concerns, which was unfortunate. The canteen was out of reach, so I could never join my colleagues for a cup of coffee or lunch. I felt hugely isolated during lunchtime and hated it. I sat on my own in a large vacant space on my desk and ate alone, sticking out like a sore thumb. The basic problem of working in India was the lack of accessibility. Even toilets for people with disabilities were not accessible. As basic a need as that had not been thought out by the authorities. The toilet had one or two steps. Once I fell and was badly hurt. My attendant was with me, but there were no bars, so I fell. I had to leave the job. I missed the social chitter chatter, but there was no option. I was not able to go out on my own. The pavements are not rounded to be disability friendly. There are too many people and the streets have too many potholes. I was very accepting. But then I did not know anything better. I did not question much. At Oxford, studying desktop publishing, DTP, had helped. Me learn page maker, Ventura. I became involved in designing lethal ETS and information booklets for the Spastic Society for the inauguration of their new building in Bandra. The funds had come from Sweden. Kamal Bakshi was the vice chairman of ADAPT and was the then ambassador of Sweden. Uncle Kamal and Umi Auntie, his wife, as I called them, are very close to us. They helped in the development and growth of the Spas Tick Society, now called ADAPT. Uncle Kamal, our patron Sunil Dutt and dad raised money from the Church of Sweden. Margaretha Ringström, the director of the Church of Sweden became a great friend of mother's and became involved in our project to build the spectacular and magnificent building in Bandra, which now houses the OFFICES of our society. Moving again to London. 105. Just as I was settling into life in Bombay, meeting up with old friends and busying myself with the Spastic Society, a letter, enclosed in a London School of Economics, LSE, envelope, arrived. It was for mother. I wondered what it was. Mother opened it. She looked quite pleased and handed it to dad who said, darling, of course you must accept it. Mother had been invited by the LSE to serve in the capacity of an academic busy tour for a year. What an honor we all thought. Malls, you must come with me of course. What a wonderful experience it will be. I was in between jobs. I was finding it difficult to sustain a job simply because of accessibility and attitudinal barriers. Yes, I beamed excitedly on hearing my mother's invite. I was going to go back to my favorite place and country. It felt like my home, as I had been so easily accepted. There was no problem of toilets and even the buses had ramps. I was sure that the job prospects would be far better for people with dis ability as well. I would be exposed to more assistive technology and aids. Yes, I was looking forward to going back. We left Bombay in the middle of September. Mother, Maya, and I waved goodbye to our family in Bombay. It was an emo tional farewell. When we arrived in London, we did not have a place to stay. Margaret Ecudiel, a very close friend of mother, was the Phi RST person to stay at the Bandra Center of the Spastic Society when only the scaffolding was up when she came to Bombay. She knew how difficult it was to Phi ND a house in central London. She requested her sister, Liz, for help and they, Liz and David Nussbaum, immediately opened their own home. One little finger. 106. For us. I do not know of anybody who would have made such a gesture. Liz and David had a beautiful home in Putney. It was a warm, comfortable space and had lots of books and a piano. There was a huge garden that one could bury oneself in and read a book in quiet solitude. For me, greenery was like heaven. I craved for it in Bombay. Mother and dad were hunting for a FL at Like Maniacs. Have we got the evening standard today, asked mother as we zoomed past Hyde Park Corner onto Marble Arch. The two main sources with property rental listings were the evening standard and the London School of Economics housing list. No, the evening standard comes out at noon so we will pick it up now, said dad as he drove along the busiest streets of London. He was very good at directions and could drive around with ease in any of the European cities. Why don't we look at the LSE listings, gestured dad, as he handed mother the papers. There's one on Baker Street, said mother. Malls just see the number. Please call it out, said mother to me as we sat and sipped cold coffee at a Starbucks on Baker Street. 
The number had been written in Phi any print, and I could read it despite wearing thick glasses. Don't be passive and lazy, said Mother. Mother was always urging me to do more to participate. I called out the number to Mother, and an appointment was made for 5 o'clock in the evening. They came back beaming after meeting the landlady of the FL at. We like it but it's a bit steep. Moving again to London. 107. It was a huge three-bedroom house with two bathrooms, a spacious kitchen, and a central dining room. I had a cozy single room. I used to love reading late, often staying up till the early hours of the morning. We converted the third bedroom into a study. The FL had had a massive kitchen where we ate breakfast. The kitchen was a place of solace for Maya, where she loved reading her Nepalese romances. Our friend Bobby had given me her old Amstrad. It was a simple word processor. I bashed away, attempting short stories and wrote long letters home to the rest of the family in India. At the Baker Street FL at Dad loved shopping and bought everything in bulk. Mother had a passion for cooking, and the British palate seemed to be fond of her dishes. So we did a lot of entertaining. We stayed in Baker Street for a year. It was a year of luxurious splendor. AF to a year we had to move. Dad found another, smaller FL at on. Devonshire Street. Again it was very centrally located, Oxford. Street was a stone's throw away. Sometimes, Maya and I would venture into the interior parts of Soho, where Chinatown is, and we used to guzzle down dumplings and Chinese buns. Maya became a good friend. Regent's Park was just round the corner. At this time, Amy, my grandmother, came and stayed with us and the three of us would spend a lot of time together in the parks. We would make routine visits to Trafalgar Square and the city's various museums. I met up with my friends Rosie and John. Rosie had become a chaplain of a women's prison in Suffolk. She asked me to talk to the prisoners. What a great experience. Initially they did not know how to react to me. After my talk there were a lot of questions. Looking back, it was definitely one of my best talks. One Little Finger 108 Most of the time was spent in libraries because of the demands of the PhD, mother had a very good supervisor, Jennifer of ANS, who became a close friend of ours. Through our studies, we found that the old medical model of disability had changed to a rights-based approach, which was known as the social model. According to this, if a disabled person could not access to a FI CES, restaurants, libraries etc., it was not because she or he could not walk, but because of the faulty design of the environment, or the faulty attitude of society. The old belief that a disabled person had to be FI XED, FI TED and cured had changed to a more social approach. This definition made a clear distinct tie-in between the impairment itself, such as, a medical condition that makes a person unable to walk, and the disabling effects of society in relation to that impairment. In simple terms, it is not the inability to walk that prevents a person from entering a building unaided, but rather the design or location of stairs that are inaccessible to a wheelchair user. In other words, disability is socially constructed. Mother read about the critiques against institutionalization, against special schools, entrenched negative policies and shared all this new knowledge each day with me and dad. The current belief was that disabled children should study with their normal peers, and this was known as inclusive education. Being educated with their normal peers from a young age meant disabled children were in the mainstream, and therefore found it easier to be included in all spheres of life. Today, the social model has taken center stage which says it is the entrenched exclusionary laws, society's attitudes, the environment, and not the person that needs fishing. It was also around that time that the disability movement was born. The slogan for the day was, nothing for the disabled without disabled people. Moving again to London. 109. All this fascinated her. It was on her exposure to such ideas, that mother felt the need to study further and do her PhD. Her research was to investigate a particular government of India policy, known as the Integrated Child Development Scheme, ICDS, the world's largest preschool policy run by the government. The ICDS operates amongst the poorest sections of the population in India, for preschool children in the age range of 0 to 6 years. Although the ICDS policy states that it is for all children, in practice, it does not address the question of disabled children. The research question was, what was the explanation for ICDS not explicitly excluding, but not directly addressing, the needs of the preschool disabled child within their existing provisions for the weaker and more vulnerable sections of society? Mother was accepted. The Institute of Education in the University of London was beautifully situated. In Bloomsbury. Mother was given a two-room FL at on the Phi RST. FL UR, usually given to PhD researchers. Bloomsbury could not have been more ideal. Camden, Soho, Leicester Square, the Parks, Russell Square, the British Museum, the most happen ING parts of London were all walking or wheelchair distance for me. Woburn Square was not as plush as Baker Street or Devonshire Street, but it was wonderful. Woburn Square is the smallest of the Bloomsbury Squares and owned by the University of London. Woburn Square was designed by Thomas Cubitt and built between 1829 and 1847. It was named after Woburn Abbey, the main country seat of the Duke of Bedford, who developed much of Bloomsbury. The square was always kept locked and only the residents of the square had access to it, like all squares. The area was very pretty, and most of all it was familiar territory for us. One Little Finger 110 The only snag in the place is that it is up one FL out of stairs, said Dad, but the location is fantastic. The FL it was a one-bedroom and one-living-room space. It had a tiny kitchenette and a bathroom, it was small but cozy. 
In both the rooms there were beautiful large French windows which overlooked the square. When we woke up and sipped our morning tea, we could hear the peaceful whistling of the plane trees which soothed our spirits and prepared us for the rest of the day. At the same time Professor Klaus Weddell, who was Director of Special Needs at the Institute of Education and a friend of Mother's, invited me and Mother to a communication seminar workshop. We went and heard very articulate disabled people talk about the concept of rights and entitlements. There were people who were more severely disabled than me but all could communicate independently. I seemed hopelessly dependent and helpless compared to them. My speech was incoherent and terribly difficult to understand. It continued to depress me immensely, ever since I was confronted with well-articulated young who would chatter away, albeit nonsense. Often, I would come home from college and would collapse in a pile of tears. To me, communication is like water, the essence of life. What could I do without FLU and speech? Hearing the speakers, we felt that it was important now to be able to communicate independently without needing a third party. We went to Roehampton Hospital in Putney for an assessment of my communication difficulties. Initially, I was against the idea of having a big communication device like the one Professor Stephen Hawking has, as it was extremely visible. Moving again to London. 111. And it made my disability look prominent, but I was recommended a smaller and more compact version called the Toby Churchill. What I liked most was that I could carry it in my handbag. Unfortunately that version only has a male voice with a thick American accent. I am told that a new version is now available with a female voice. With the communicator, it was wonderful at communal gatherings like lectures and parties. I should not leave out my favorite place, the pubs. For the Phi RST time, I did not need a third party to interpret me. My family and friends seemed to be interested in what I had to say. This empowered me a great deal. I had to be cerebral in my topics of conversation. I had to be up to date with the news, reading The Guardian, and listen ING to Radio 4. It took me ages to remember key points of the current headlines. I was always ecstatic with the electric wheelchair. The electric wheelchair gave me a tremendous feeling of movement and space. With this, I did not feel as if I could not walk. I did not feel helpless. I could slip into shops, chemists, bookshops, residential torrents, etc. Whatever the so-called normal person does, I could do. I did this with ease and it did wonders for my self-confidence. I was whizzing around, with mother and Maya sauntering way behind. Maya had supreme confidence in my sense of direction, and always followed me blindly. When I was with dad, he always walked ahead while I wheeled behind. I realized that I was confident and persevering enough to manage the busiest London roads on my own. I realized that I could go anywhere. In my own mind I was ready to tackle the London streets on my own. Friends used to marvel at how I navigated my wheelchair through hordes of tourists. One little finger. 112. Through Leicester Square and Soho without touching anyone. Yes, I had to be careful as I knew how very painful it would be if the wheelchair hit one's leg. We could not have done anything like this in India. I read somewhere that there were over 1,000 potholes and very little pavement space. The pavements were not rounded and hence not accessible to wheelchairs. Moving around outdoors is not an easy task in India. I remember clearly when I actually began negotiating the London streets on my own. I would go out frequently but was always accompanied by my parents or Maya. Can I come and pick you up mum? I asked one morning. I had just woken up and was still snuggled into my cozy IKEA duvet cover. She was going to the Institute of Education's library to read. It was a beautiful sunny day in London. Okay, why don't you come with Maya, said mother as she took her time in picking out her clothes. Mother took no time to adjust to life in England and had effortlessly switched to wearing trousers and skirts rather than the usual Indian dress. Mother was always pristinely dressed. No, I would rather come on my own, I pleaded. I went on nagging her about how I desired solitude at times. At the age of 28, it was too stifle ing to be accompanied by someone constantly, I wanted a bit of freedom to be on my own for a while. I will be very careful. I promised. Mother reluctantly gave in. Okay, she said, adding, you always get what you want. I grinned silently knowing very well that when I want something, I will go out of my way for it. Please tell Maya, I said fi rmly, or else she won't listen. Moving again to London. 113. Maya was petrified edition, madam, it's dangerous, how can you let her? No madam, it's too dangerous. I will go with her, she repeatedly said. No, we must allow this as it is important to enable Malini to be as independent as possible. What I am learning in my studies is to ensure that disabled people have freedom. Be it the freedom to walk around or to speak and express. We must encourage them to carry out their day-to-day -day activities solely by themselves, which will strengthen them, said mother as she put on her black shoes. Let her come on her own, Maya, said mother. I was very excited, but I did not show it in case Maya changed her mind and decided to come along, which would ruin everything. This was my chance to prove to the world that I could master the London roads without getting hit. It was April and spring was unfolding. The days grew longer as we approached the solstice and the temperature grew warmer. We walked along to Budgeons, a supermarket, making in cons. Quenchal chatter. Then the moment came when Maya and I had to part ways. She was petrify edition. Okay, bye, I said confidently as I waved goodbye. I must admit that I was a trifle e nervous myself, but whizzed along through Gower Street, I passed through University Street onto Woburn Square, and onto the concourse of the Institute of Education. 
I wanted to shriek with joy but restrained myself as I did not want people to assume that I was straight out of space or belonged to a lunatic asylum. Oh hi, said mother as she put her books on the back of my wheelchair. Where's Maya, she asked as though nothing undenari had happened. Don't you remember our conversatian in the morning, I said quietly. One little finger. 114. Oh yes, I'd forgotten. You made it alone. Congratulations darling, said mother. We sauntered home together. From then on, I went everywhere on my own to bookshops, supermarkets, parks. I changed several buses to meet friends. For the Phi RST time, I could shop on my own. I particularly enjoyed window shopping and would often go have a look around various supermarkets, clothes shops, sales etc et era. That moment was joyous as I moved onto the track of becoming an empowered disabled adult in London. I remember going into Dylan's, the university bookshop, once without my light writer. I wanted a particular book called Mustn't Grumble by Lois Keith. For a few moments, I did not know what to do. Then I saw a terminal, which became my savior. I frantically gestured that I wanted to use the computer. The shopkeeper waited patiently, while I laboriously spelt out the name of the book on a computer. I half-heartedly gave the gentleman my telephone number, thinking that he would not ring, as he prob. Abley had not understood my garbled speech. But three hours later he called. I went, consumed by a great feeling of acceptance and euphoria, to pick up the book I had ordered. Since then, I would take the light writer with me. Instead of giving them my phone number, I gave them my email address. One day Maya left. Her family needed her in Calcutta. I was left to my own device. I was thirty-odd years at the time, but I felt I had not achieved much in terms of my independence. Without Maya, I had a chance of proving myself. I think that is when I began doing things on my own. Actually coming to think of it, my lack of independence by RST became a source of difficulty during the time of mother's PhD, mother worked ten or twelve hours a day. Moving again to London. 115. Yes, I was naturally upset, but I feel that carers come and go. I strongly believe that no carer should be regarded as a permanent fi steward of life. I was counseling mum and dad as it upset them more than me. I told them that caring for disabled people is not easy, and they can get burnt out. There has to be a turnover of carers after a long period. Without Maya, I began to take on more of the outside work. This was self-imposed. It was, in a way, a relief not to have Maya around. I felt free instead of being constantly forced to be with someone, and having to tell someone what to do. Every human being needs space and time on their own to develop and think. If a disabled person is constantly with a person and taken care of, she or he is not going to develop into their own person. My parents praised me and said I was very mature and wise. Our entertainment and social networking was cut down because Maya was not with us. This helped mother, who focused. Entirely on completing her PhD, mother was on a strict dead line and she spent most of her time in the evening working and writing. One afternoon, a couple of weeks after we moved, dad decided to train me on how to climb stairs using the banisters for support. He felt that I could do it myself. I held onto the banisters like grim death. I was petrified that I might fall, a fear that still dominated me. I have always been apprehensive about doing anything physical that can hurt me. This could be owing to a trigger in an area in the brain that recalls the hurt that was caused at birth with the cord round my neck. Perhaps that made me less forthcoming in doing anything that needs a physical effort. Mother always put it down to you are being lazy. One little finger. 116. Now Malls, hold your two hands onto the banisters and take two steps onto the next step slowly, said Dad. No, I can't do it, I cried, as he guided me near the staircase. I was petrified addition anxiety overpowered me. I was ready to give up. You can do it Malls, just concentrate, he said gently but sternly. I took one step, and then another, and then I slid my hand gradually down the banister. I had done it, once, then again, and then again. Slowly, I managed to make my way to the stairs. Dad was of course, remained just behind me. I could feel him every time I took the next step, which helped to bolster my confidence. It soon became relatively easy. Of course it was good exercise. Very good, Dad said as he gave me a hug. We were both ecstatic. We could not wait to show Mother. Mother was exultant and thrilled as she watched me taking the steps. She stood beside me patiently as I walked down the entire FLI of 30. Two steps. Later, I began to do this task completely on my own. When Mother was not around. I was also very independent because of my electric wheelchair. Every morning, I would get ready and wander around. The whole day stretched before me to explore. I went to library IES, bookshops, supermarkets and exhibitions. Let's go and see a French Phi LM, proposed mother one day. Why don't you and Malls go? Suggested dad. It was easy for mother and me to slip into a cab and reach the cinema hall at Leicester Square. With my electric wheelchair, I did not need anyone to push me. Cinema halls were accessible and my electric wheelchair could easily go into the hall. From then onwards, mother and I went everywhere alone. Moving again to London. 117. My favorite pastime was going to the famous Waterstone bookshop and reading for hours. I was an avid reader and Fi niched many books. It was at times embarrassing, as I spent hours at the store and the shopkeepers would often give me sharp and stern looks. I read biographies, romances and thrill airs. 
It was such fun, not having to buy, but reading for free. I was free. Free to go anywhere I wanted. This was very different from the situation in India. It made me forget that I could not walk mother was busy writing her PhD. For the Phi RST time in my life I was in charge and responsible for my day. It was wonderful to have long stretches of time to myself. At lunchtime, I normally used the institute's canteen. Within a few weeks, the kitchen staff knew my needs and would serve me my usual order without me even asking. I loved Phi SH and chips. The smell of fresh fried Phi SH titillated my taste buds. I often ate lunch alone. Slowly, I ventured out to new places. Mother, I am going to have Kentucky Fried Chicken, I said. And whizzed off on my wheelchair. I opened the doors of the restaurant with my legs and wheeled up to the queue. Due to my poor speech, the servers could not understand me, so I pointed at two pieces of chicken legs, chips and a coke. The servers came, brought me my order and took the right amount of change, helping me to fi nd a vacant table. So helpful and so unquestioning, I wondered why everyone was not like them. Again, I was consumed by that great feeling of euphoria, which reminded me that I was independent and free. Despite her rigorous regime, that she infl icted on herself to complete her PhD in a short period of time, mother always had time to cook one dish in the evening. Mother was an excel lent cook. I strongly believe that being a gourmet cook has its one little finger. 118. Disadvantages as we, as a family, were extremely fine Nikki about what we ate, and poor mother has had to plan endless gourmet meals. Kaka and Vrinda often came over as they normally visited Europe every year. I decided to show off my knowledge of London, and took Kaka to a Turkish restaurant on St. James Street. Where are we going? asked Kaka. I am taking you to a cozy restaurant on St. James Street, I said. Kaka hated walking. He was used to getting into a car and being driven around by a chauffeur. Malini, how far is it? He moaned and groaned, getting impatient. I am very impressed by you and how much you know of London, said Kaka, lighting his cigarette and ordering our drinks. You should definitely stay on a few more months in London, as you are so independent here, Kaka said, one morn ing, I mustered up the courage and approached mother and pleaded. Mother had a Phi XED seat by the PhD, common room win. Dao from where she could watch the concourse. She thought that she could keep an eye on my whereabouts but she rarely could. Thank God the use of the mobile phone was not a common practice as yet. One day, mother said, Malls I will teach you how to use an email account. Mother had just completed a beginner's course in electronic mail use at the Institute of Education. She let me into the PhD study room with explicit instructions that I could be thrown out as soon as any PhD student came in. I agreed and quite often, as students came and went I had to. Moving again to London. 119. Move away. She logged onto a computer, typed the password and opened a blank page on the computer screen. I typed a short email to my cousin sisters. She then showed me how to type in the address, and with the mouse I clicked send. I did this action two or three times. Within a day or two, I got the hang of it. I acquired a number of email addresses of friends and relatives. I found the computer and Windows software easy to use, and I learned how to access my email. The email technology revolutionized my life. I was able to communicate on my own. I opened a Hotmail account of my own. Then while mother was busy, I learned to research on the internet. I could read papers online or could search for jobs or look at what was going on. The internet opened up a whole new world to me. For the Phi RST time, I had access to any kind of information. To be able to get any information that I wanted, really empowered me and stimulated my thought processes. I could also communicate with whoever I wanted without re querying a third party. This also empowered my thinking tremendously. And I made friends with students who were study ING for their masters and PhDs, and who were closer to my age. Having mastered the internet and my light writer, my skills of communication improved vastly. I had my own independent means of communication. This was a kind of freedom from being trapped by my speech impediment and communication difficulties. Seeing my contagious smile and friendly nature, as others often tell me, I became friends with quite a few people in the institute. Initially, due to my poor speech, I interacted with them through the internet. Slowly I hung out with them at the IOE bar, being able to communicate using my light writer. One little finger. 120. They were quite unconcerned about my poor speech. I used my light writer extensively. I began to grow in my thinking and began forming independent relationships. During the day, I managed the household chores like lawn dry and shopping for groceries. For the Phi RSD time, as a woman, I had a choice of choosing my own things and choosing what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I got used to managing the days on my own and doing the shopping, whether it was buying the medicines the family needed, the toiletries, or the cleaning detergents. People in the supermarkets, the chemists and the bookshops, all came forward to help me, something that I had rarely experienced in India. I must admit I was slightly scared, I was afraid that my wheelchair would break down, or that someone may sense that I was alone and unnecessarily worry about me. If one really thought about it, I had stepped out from my body and the realization of how disabled I really was because I was totally alone now with speech which was difficult for others to pick up quickly. Yes a million things could go wrong, as mother often warned me, but I was not willing to let my thoughts go down that path. I decided I would worry about these concerns later. Mother was quite absent-minded. 
Malls, do you want a mince pie? She asked one day. Yes, I said. A minute later we heard a scream followed by a loud noise. Mother ran to the kitchen. The microwave had exploded. She had put the Marks and Spencer's mince pie with the foil into the microwave. I think the microwave has burst, said Mother ashamedly, not knowing what had gone wrong. When Dad came in, we explained the problem. He examined the microwave. Can we fi exit, asked Mother. She loved old things and hated buying new. Moving again to London. 121. Things. Dad was the opposite, he loved shopping and never believed in recycling or repairing. No, it will cost more to repair. It is better to buy another, said Dad. So the next day Dad and I went and bought a new microwave. My wheelchair was always used by us as a pull-along carrier on wheels. We put the microwave in a big lawn dry bag and put it behind my wheelchair and carried it home. The old one was thrown out. Malls, we need pasta and cherry tomatoes, said Mother one day, as she went off to work after having a quick cup of tea with me. I whizzed off past Russell Square to a Safeway in Brunswick Square. I had such good experiences in the supermarket while shopping. It was unbelievable how helpful people were. Nobody stared. Nobody asked me rude questions. If I could not reach for things, other shoppers would pass me an item. This was so different from India, where they would have come up to me and asked me a million questions, apart from staring. At me. The cashiers took out the right amount of change from. My purse, never more or never less. They or other shoppers put the bags of shopping on the back of my wheelchair, and I was home. It was a good community experience. It made me feel like a contributing member of the family, doing my bit for the housework. Next, I tackled the laundrette. Dad and I usually did the laundry together but on this occasion, he was busy, and there was a mountain of dirty clothes that had piled up. Don't worry, I said one day. Can you put the laundry bag on the back of the wheelchair? I asked Mother confidently. Again, there was great resistance. How are you going to take the clothes out? Who will put it into the machine? One little finger. 122. I said, please allow me to work this out. Thank goodness I had democratic and understanding parents who encouraged me to be as independent as possible, despite some occasional resistance. I whizzed away on my wheelchair to Brunswick Square Laundrette feeling rapturous at the thought of being useful and doing my share of housework. I entered the Laundrette. The attendant in charge immediately approached me and asked if I needed help. I nodded smilingly. I then went browsing and ran some other errands. Forty-five minutes later I got back to make sure that the clothes were put into the dryer. Again, I browsed at the shops as I waited for the clothes to dry. I returned. The attendant again helped. I supervised the folding and had the attendant put it on the back of my wheelchair. Then I was off home. Slowly, with experiences that encouraged me to be more and more independent, I became bolder. 123. A Bold French Holiday Are you going on a summer holiday this year? I asked Fiona during one of our long telephone conversations from Bristol to London. Fi and I have known each other since we were toddlers. Our mothers, her mother's name is Janet, were pregnant at the same time, both were living in the steel city of India known as Jumshedpur where my father was based when he was working with Tata. Her parents, the Baines, and we stayed in a huge bungalow with gardens all around. They were called the Kaiser Bungalows. Her father was working with a British company. Our parents soon became close friends. Our mothers were typical ladies of leisure, as they attended the same coffee parties and enjoyed the club culture. Over the years as the Baines moved back to England, the friendship progressed as we made routine trips to England and made it a point to visit them in their Solihull house in Birmingham. Phi, too, spent time in India with us. A summer holiday. No, I do not have any plans yet, she said. Why don't we go somewhere together, she suggested. Sure, why not? I said unbelievingly. Where would you like to go? Paris slipped out from my lips as if we were playing a game. One little finger. 124. Seriously, let's go, she said. Yes, let's go. We will have so much fun. After I put down the phone, I promptly forgot about our conversation. I could not possibly imagine anyone wanting to take on the challenge of taking me, as well as, the wheelchair, for a holiday. Malini, I have found out the price of tickets for a round trip to Paris. Please call me back, was the message left on the ensuring machine one evening. It was midnight when I heard it. I had gone to see a play, My Girl, at the West End Theater with my friend Judith, and then for dinner at a Chinese restaurant in Soho. I had to wait until the morning to get in touch with Phi. I rang her up at 9 o'clock sharp, eager to know what was on her mind. If we spend a Saturday night in Paris, it will be cheaper, I said. Both of us had only a few pennies in the bank, but that did not deter us from planning a visit to the most romantic city. In the world. So we were going. It seemed as it were a dream. We made the booking of a hotel through the Tour Brochure access in Paris. The book proved to be a very worthwhile asset for our holiday. Mother rang up at least 20 hotels and tried to convey in her broken French that the booking required a disabled friendly room with access for a wheelchair. The day finally arrived. I met Fiona at Heathrow, an hour before the FLI was scheduled to take off. Mother advised her never to leave the wheelchair unattended and to always put the brakes on when it was stopped. Phi was amazed to see what SPE style treatment my wheelchair and I received at Heathrow. I like traveling with both of you, she said after we got to our seats. Ladies would you like champagne instead of wine, asked a gorgeous young British Airways steward, who took a liking. 
A bold French holiday. 125. To us. Seeing the smiles on our faces, he gave us for bottles of champagne. We opened one, and the rest we put into Fi's big black bag to use as nightcaps. I discovered that Fi's reaction to the intake of wine was similar to mine. A small amount of alcohol would put her spirits on cloud nine. We drove across the city to our hotel, imbibing the beauty of Paris, and nursing the idea of a few glasses of champagne. I was euphoric too, as I could not believe I was in Paris with a friend. Hotel de France was in the heart of the city, very close to the Latin Quarter in Saint Germain. Monument des Invalides, built by Napoleon for the war veterans, was opposite the hotel, and its golden gigantic dome served as a landmark for us. The hotel was run by a couple who spoke very little English. Bonjour and au revoir were the only two words that we said to them daily. We had reserved a double bedroom with a spacious bathroom and a fridge. It served as a comforting and luxurious respite after our hectic days. Having spent an hour working out our itinerary and examined ING our map, we walked to the Eiffel Tower. We found the traffic Fi C lights confusing. Whenever we crossed the road, our hearts were in our mouths, especially Fi's, whose task was to navigate my wheelchair. At one point my wheelchair nearly went under a car. However, by the last day, she and my wheelchair grew close, as they had devised their own methods of assaulting the French traffic C. Tour Diffel was magnificent. It was thronged with tourists from all over the world. Although the queue was long, it moved quickly. We went up one FL or in an overcrowded lift and emerged to see the view of Paris. What a splendid and breathtaking sight. As public transport was inaccessible to the wheelchair, we walked to most places. Fiona had never walked. One little finger. 126. So much in her life. This time our destination was the Louvre. The walk to it was exquisite, alongside the gardens spread out across Paris, which to me made the city extremely romantic. We were delighted to discover in our guidebook that the entry to the Louvre was free. Free it may be, but it was initially highly confusing as to where to enter from. But soon our high-powered intelligence equaled that of the French, and we were in. The Louvre was a happening and busy museum. It was massive and was divided into two sections, one for the history of France and its relation to the world, and the other for their world-famous art collection. We found their impeccable collectine of art through the corridors unending but majestic. Every picture had its own beauty. I wished that I could get postcards of all the paintings so as to keep them in my memory. Hordes of people gathered around with video cameras trying to cap. Tour the famous mystical smile of the Mona Lisa. Of course. Being a typical tourist, I had to buy a poster of the Mona Lisa before I left the Louvre. Fatigue set in after five VE hours. We felt that we had imbibed enough, although we had only seen a quarter of the Louvre. So to refresh our tired bodies, we treated ourselves to lunch at a French cafe on the banks of River Seine. The atmosphere revived us, and then we moved on to the Notre Dame. When we arrived, the evening service had just finished and the organ was playing in the background. A spirit of euphoria overcame me as we moved around the church. I'd never before seen such beautiful paintings of the mother and child. A few priests were busy wrapping up, but they looked as though they were doing it in time to the music. I felt a spiritual presence encircle me. I prayed and thought about how lucky I had been. A Bold French Holiday 127. In life. The memory of the Notre Dame will always be indelible in my mind. Smoky time, said Fi, which was her frequent excuse for stopping. This time the halt was on a pont, bridge, which proved to be an interesting one. Many like us were watching some boys practicing roller skating up and down the pont. Skating was the one thing that I never wished I could do as a child. The skaters were extremely friendly and came up and chatted with us. One of them was so taken up with Fi that he asked her out, but Fi declined and hid behind my wheelchair. We were overwhelmed by their friendliness. Our next halt was at the Latin Quarter. The ambience was European. Cafes were Fi led with people, young musicians were playing the famous tune of Dites, Moi Porcoy, that brought back memories of my aunt, Mashi, who used to sing it to me when I was a child. We had a three-course set meal, consisting of a rich, homemade pate, grilled chicken cooked with white wine, followed by dessert for which we had a mouth-watering. Mousse et la chocolate. All this was washed down with a half-carafe of Chardonnay, whilst watching and enjoying Parisian life. Our agenda for the day was not yet over, a boat ride at night. Was a must. The boat accommodated me with ease. The moon shone on us like a guiding light. The ride was majestic. Paris looked even more beautiful lit up, just as we had imagined. The last day we splurged a little and bought ingredients for a picnic lunch and plenty of booze. We had a champagne picnic at Monument des Invalides, the nearby park. Fortunately, we did not finish the whole bottle, and instead shared a large mug full. One little finger. 128. Can we take a cab back to the hotel, pleaded Fi, turning to me as I was controlling the budget. Yes but just this once, I said, also feeling a bit high with champagne. The next day, we took a train to Montmartre and saw Sacre Coeur. Montmartre was full of artists painting detailed portraits. A few came up to us and asked us if we wanted our portraits done, but soon discovered that we were not rich tourists. While sitting there, I thought about Nick and his French girlfriend Aleka, who would often tell me stories about their days in Paris. The stairs at Sacre Coeur did not prevent us from seeing the church. I managed to walk up the stairs easily. Two tourists helped us lift my wheelchair, but they did not put my wheelchair's brakes on, so she went hurtling down the hundred steps. My poor wheelchair, how embarrassing it was for her, as everybody stopped to see what she was doing and gaped at her as if. It was some sort of entertainment showpiece. 
Thank goodness. I was not on it. The church was certainly worth the climb. We discovered the lift too late, it was pointed out to us by a kindly priest. Fi had seen a cozy French bistro near the Latin Quarter the night before, and was determined to take me there as it looked like it served good authentic French food. We arrived too late, to Fi ND the restaurant closed, but we had fallen in love with the area. So we looked around and finally found a quiet Italian residential torrent. We ordered spaghetti carbonara and Fi nished a whole bottle of Chianti which chatting and REFL acting on our hectic but exciting three days. Unfortunately, our holiday ended in a series of disasters. A bold French holiday. 129. First the taxi driver took us to Charles de Gaulle Airport instead of Orly and charged us double the fare. Fi was on the verge of giving him a sock on his face, which I somehow had to prevent. Luckily we had saved some money which we threw at him with utter chagrin. The second disaster was our plane at Orly Airport, which was facing engine trouble. We were kept waiting for over two hours. We tried our best to remain calm and patient, as all had gone well so far without a hitch. At last there was an announcement saying, certain passengers whose names will be called out will be transferred onto another FL-8. Our names were not on the list. Panic set in but within 10 minutes a steward came and rescued us and upgraded us to club class. Although we eventually got to Heathrow, it was a couple of hours late. Mother was waiting, quite frantic. Then the next disaster occurred. We found out that our bags had been left behind. You will get them within a day, the British Airways hostess. Smiled and said quite nonchalantly. The only trouble was my four bottles of wine were in Fiona's bags and Fiona was going to Portugal, which is where her bags were to be delivered. I lost a few nights of sleep worrying about whether I would get my French wine. Two weeks later my wine arrived. Two weeks. Imagine the sleep I had to catch up on. For me, it was a unique holiday. It was the Phi RST time in my whole 28 years that someone, apart from my immediate fam Eile, had had the courage to take me in my wheelchair out for a holiday. My spirit soared. I felt like a bird out of a cage. What a most memorable time under the bridges of Paris, down by the River Seine. 130. Empowerment in Academia I was becoming more and more independent. I was minig ing my own chores, my own shopping, my own social interactions, I was free, and not dependent on others around me. I felt empowered and was keen to face new challenges. It was mid-November, 1998. The academic term began in September, but the institute wanted to enroll as many foreign students as they could, even if it was a little later in the term. Foreign students brought in more income, as they were required to pay thrice the fee a domestic student did. The institute was FL ooded with Japanese students. When they saw me, they would often bow down. It was a polite gesture. What does Malini want to do and like to do with her life? Said Anne, an academic friend of mother's. Would Malini like to study about the empowerment of women? And asked. Do you think she would feel more empowered if she did the masters on gender studies? This focuses on women, there is. Sue's their challenges and strengthening their beliefs through a study of well-known feminist theories, she said. I will ask her, I think she would be interested, mother said. How about studying again, Malini? Said mother as we strolled through Russell Square. I was now more adept on the computer. My power of communication had improved considerably. My one little Phi Inger. Empowerment in Academia 131 Was a powerhouse of strength. I used email all the time. To me the email and the light writer boosted my confidence. They were my voice which was scarcely heard. My speed on the computer had increased tremendously. I interacted a lot with my parents and friends. They took time to listen and valued what I had to say. My opinion was asked for on many issues and people treated me as an equal. Also, London being such a cerebral country, one is constantly learning something new, through the radio, television, the newspapers and the people around. There is not a more intellectually stimulating place than London. After reading extensively about disabled people coming to the forefront of things and taking up the Phi GHT for their own rights, themselves, mother began questioning me on what I really wanted to do. Also, being in the company of MA and PhD students spurred me on to thinking that perhaps I could manage the masters with my one little Phi Inger. I cannot go up and down London aimlessly forever, I thought. Do you think I can? I said anxiously. Given a chance I could but try, the worst scenario is that I would not be admit Ted or that I would fail. The chance came soon. An interview was set up for me at four o'clock with Professor Diana Leonard, the head of WOM and studies at the Institute of Education. As I wheeled myself along the familiar institute's corridors, I felt hugely nervous of whether the professors would understand me. My dysarthic speech would surely be a deterrent. I would be compared to the normal student by a yardstick that judged the conversations they made and how articulate they were. I would surely fail with such a comparison. One little finger. 132. We knocked at the door, mother and I. Hi, said Diana. This is my colleague, Debbie. They both stood up and shook hands with me. Diana Leonard and Debbie Epstein were in their early five dies. Both of them were prolifici writers, reputed and distinguished academics, who focused on women's issues. Diana's special area of research was women's work at home, which was a form of work that went unrecognized. Debbie's area of interest was gender and sexuality, and why some women's sexuality is hidden. I noticed that both Diana and Debbie were very sensitive toward me. They listened to my speech attentively. They asked me a couple of questions. Why do you want to do women's studies? 
Have you read any books pertaining to women? I mentioned a couple of books by women writers, which seemed to impress them. The interview lasted 15 minutes. I used my voice synthesizer as much as possible throughout the inter. View. Finally, they told me that they would let me know. For two weeks, I was on tenterhooks. Then finally one morning, a letter arrived. Dad usually came in from the gym with the post. Malls, there is a letter from the institute, if you wait for 5e minutes, I will make myself a cup of tea, and open the letter, said Dad. Those 5e minutes seemed like 5e hours, as I anxiously waited for Dad to open the letter. He pottered around endlessly, making his tea. I was sipping my mug of tea, but my eyes followed his movements. My stomach churned. I was convinced that it was going to be another rejection letter. Now let's see, he said, as he took out his gold-plated letter opener, which I recently gifted him for his birthday, and read out. Empowerment in Academia 133 Dear Miss Chib, I take the opportunity to inform you that you have been grant ed admission to the master's program. I was stunned for a few minutes. C-O-N-G-R-A-T-U-L-A-T-I-O-N-S, said both mother and dad as they hugged me. We were all ecstatic. We soon passed on the message to Nickel. We must get a scholarship, said mother in her usual practical way. She always said this. Yes, I readily agreed. I told my friend Charmaine, who was from Malta, and Greg, who was from America. Hi, I said to Greg, as I got into my electric wheelchair. Greg was in the middle of completing his master's dissertation. Greg and I had long heated discussions about the social model, society and people. I showed him the letter. Good for you, but it's a lot of hard work, said Greg Kasu Ally. I know. It will need a lot of work and writing. I hope I will be able to do it, I said apprehensively. You will need more time, said Greg practically. See, you. Need to look into the Students with Disabilities Document Pub. Lished by the Institute of Education, he suggested, I am going to Manhattan to have breakfast. Are you coming? Yes, I said, welcoming the idea of a cup of tea. Manhattan was a quaint little coffee place on Woburn Place. We sat down. He ordered his usual of salmon and a cream cheese bagel. How can you eat this day in and day out? I teased him constantly. One little finger. 134. After eating, he opened his bag and showed me a book. See, but don't touch. He thrust the book in front of my face. The book was Disability Politics, Understanding Our Past, Changing Our Future by Jane Campbell and Mike Oliver. Please can I borrow it? I pleaded. I was very interested to know more about the recent change in the disability movement. Greg had more money than me. He bought a lot of books. I had slowly begun borrowing them and read most of his books. Through reading the current literature on disability, my empowerment began. Please, I said. Will you promise to return it? He asked. Of course, don't I always return them, I said innocently. No you don't, said Greg, pretending to be stern. Yes, I know, but you always come to take them, I said. Later we found out that I was to be CLAS SIFI ed as an overseas student, but I was not eligible to do a part-time master's as international students cannot do a part-time master's. How? Incongruous is the economics of it, a foreign student in a four. Your program obviously brought in more revenue. Was there any thinking here? That evening, we had a family meeting. I revealed what Greg had mentioned. There is no way that malls can do the masters in one year. Her speed is too slow, said mother as she sipped her cup of tea. We need to ask the university authorities to allow you to do it for four years, said mother. This is outrageous, it is unreasonable to expect Molly to complete her masters in one year, said my tutor professor. Empowerment in Academia 135 Diana Leonard in her clipped British accent. Diana had a PhD from Cambridge. I will write to Mr. Ward saying that, that there is no way that Molly can do her masters in one year. Mr. Ward was the deputy director of the institute. Emails went back and forth from Diana to Mr. Ward. Finally the battle was won. I got a call on a July morning in 1998 at 9 o'clock. Hello Molly, can you please come and see me as soon as possible? Said Diana. I got ready as quickly as I could and went to Diana's OFFICE. I wondered what could be wrong. I always imagined the worst. Has my master's admission been refused? Molly, come in, said Diana, opening the door and making space for my wheelchair. This came from Mr. Ward, Diana said and showed me the letter. The letter said, Dear Diana, the Institute has granted Miss Chib to do her master's over four years. Yours sincerely, David Ward, isn't it great, said Diana. Wow, I am so thrilled, thank you very much. You have done everything, I said, beaming. It's going to be a lot of hard work, Diana said as I left her. Room. Yes I know but thank you for believing in me, I said Navuli. The battle was by no means over. The next obstacle was AC accommodation. One little finger. 136. Where are you going to live? Said Jane one afternoon as we strolled through Russell Square. Jane and I were good friends, Jane worked in the students' registry. You know that the institute won't give you accommodation. Jane said. Why? I asked. The institute doesn't offer accommodation to part-time students, said Jane quite matter-of-factly. Jane was one of those Britishers who were sticklers for rules. The next day Jane and I met at Russell Square for a cup of tea. 
My desire to be independent was so great that I checked out every student accommodation hall, making my way to each on my wheelchair. I went to every hostel in the vicinity, the YWCA, and other such halls. Some places had disabled friendly rooms, but the answer was always negative. You can't stay in the hall alone due to fire hazard and your disability. Everywhere I went I suffered acute discrimination. Why don't you stay in a care home? They will look after. You. The institute will not take any responsibility for you in. The halls of residence because you are a disabled student. You need specialized housing, specialized care, and special handling. Why not try Leonard Cheshire Home, said Jane. I was absolutely appalled. Was this England? After being so independent, there was no way I was going to be in a care home. It upset me a great deal, and immediately I went and told Greg. This was the downside of how disabled people were treated here, everything had to be special and costly. You know she's right, unfortunately, said Greg. They haven't got their act together. Empowerment in Academia 137 Although London was so accessible physically, systems were not in place in higher education in the late 1990s. The institute had Northwest policy in place for students with disabilities, no system of support in areas of accommodation or personal assistance. I was one of the Phi RST international students who were disabled. Initially, there was reluctance amongst the higher OFFICIALs of the institute wanting to do anything special for me as an individual case. There was a person on the staff dealing with students, but she had many other responsibilities, as she was also the welfare OFFICER for the entire institute's student community. There was nobody working on these two crucial areas of accommodation and personal assistance for a student with a disability. Once they were informed about the provisions specified ed in the law of their country, by Greg and others, the administratian was willing to comply and set up a committee dealing with issues concerning disabled students. I applied for the same FL that my mother had stayed in. The administration was not willing to give it to me as a student, although earlier, I had lived there for five years. I was not entitled to it they said. Now I was a phi re-hazard. They said something I began to hear everywhere I went. No one was willing to take the responsibility of ensuring that a disabled person was safe. It showed up the fact that the institute had not addressed the equal opportunity policy and there was no accommodation for a person with a disability. Greg had already got himself on practically all student committees of the institute. He had become the president of the students' union and kept up the lobby on my behalf. He brought up the topic of accommodation for disabled students. One little finger. 138. And my need to stay in the institute's accommodation despite being disabled. Diana again got involved and wrote some key letters to the administrator of the institute. My enrollment and acceptance in the institute had caused a stir. There was quite a lot of conversation around how the institute did not have accommodation for disabled students. The lobby helped. Then one day, Greg knocked on our door on the day of my Phi RST lecture. It's done, the FL it has come through, he said. What do you mean? I asked. You have it for four whole years, I just met Mr. Ward, he said. Number 14, where we had lived for mother's PhD for five e years was now allotted to me. I screamed with joy and gave everybody a hug and immediately wanted to go out and celebrate. However, there was one condition. The institute would not be responsible for my safety. I had to get my mother to sign a document saying that my parents were responsible for my safety. The battle was not completely won. I smiled at the thought of being in Bloomsbury for four more years. I was familiar with the surroundings, the shops were easily accessible and I, with my wheelchair, had become a well-known sight. My master's classes began on the October 1, 1999. These classes were held in the evening. On the Phi RST day of the course, I was asked by my tutors to prepare a brief introduction of myself. Through the voice synthesizer, I described my physical disability. There was a great deal of interest in my story. For the Phi RST three seminars, the tutors emailed me the questions and topics that were to be discussed beforehand. This gave me an edge over my peers. It allowed me to prepare. It also made my empowerment in academia. 139. Peers understand that I was a thinking member of the team. In these weekly seminars, the tutors told us that an effective way of learning would be to form reading groups. One day as I entered class, I was surprised to see Greg. What? You are here. You didn't tell me you were going to be here, I said. The class was phi led with women from all over the world. It was hugely multicultural. There were women from South Africa, Mexico and Japan and of course from England. Greg clearly stood out. I am taking it as I am working on a chapter on identity for my PhD, said Greg. The tutors divided the class up into groups of four or six. This was a key strategy, which they often made use of. It makes students grasp a concept thoroughly. I was lucky that I was in a group of four where we could contribute our thoughts on every essay that we were given to read. In my group, there was Miriam, Anita and Helen, my friends, all patiently listening to what I was going to say. I can contribute if people are willing to listen to my monotone. As I was not experienced in discussing contents of the subjects, my Phi RST tutorial was a disappointment. I think my tutors were shocked at how little I understood. Why don't you talk to your classmates, Debbie gently encouraged me. On our EFL acting, I think this was the Phi RST time, I had peers who would listen to my speech painstakingly and respond. Work ING in a team certainly helped as we could clarify and bounce back ideas on each other. What played a crucial part was that all three of my tutors had an interest in inclusive education and in me. Having a background in inclusive education they 
One little finger. 140. Pushed others to listen to me, and pushed me to contribute meaningfully to make intellectual sense. This made me an AC Tithe contributor of the class. Thus began my academic journey where my voice was heard, and what I had to say was important for the Phi RST time in my life. This is vital for people who have speech problems, otherwise they sit passively in a class, not engaging, or interacting with the class on an intellectual level. I had missed out this form of interaction at Xavier's and at Oxford Polytechnic. Living in the campus was wonderful. I had no way of being silent. I met all my peers in class as well as socially, and they soon got to know how to understand me. Why don't we meet at 9 o'clock for coffee? Said Miriam. Great. Let's have coffee up in my FL at I said. Miriam, Helen and Anita came over and we tried to deconstruct the texts. The texts that we had to read and understand were hard. The style in which they were written was at the master's level. I spent hours in the library trying to absorb the texts. Slowly I shed my embarrassment and shyness of not being able to speak the Queen's English and began to speak in class. I began vocalizing and recounting little stories of how people oppress me and discriminate against me. Although we talked about independence and the social model, clearly again, society had not grasped it and was not willing to accept me as I was. Once as I entered the lift I said, six please. Looking very alarmed, the lady quizzed, are you alone? Where's your helper? I shook my head and luckily for me the lift stopped at my FL Ur, and I was doubt before the lady could say anything. I had done this several times before during mother's PhD, and no one had ever questioned me. When I Empowerment in Academia 141 Reached my classroom, I regaled the incident. My classmates and Diana were furious. On another occasion, I decided to go to the university canteen known as University College London, UCL, for lunch. I went in and stood in the long queue. There were throngs of freshers all in line queuing up for food. I took my cutlery and was waiting my turn to be served. In my mind, I thought maybe I was going to experience some difficulty in communicating what I wanted, but I went along with the crowd to see what happens. A young man in his thirties came up to me and offered his help. He turned to me and said, can I help you? I accepted it with alacrity. He ordered a chicken korma and chips for himself. The same for me, I said, and also gestured as it was on the board. The young man told me to go and sit while he got the food. I found a table. The food arrived. I managed to tell him to cut it up. When I believed all was well, his companion A.R. Rived. She was awful, she was very rude. She came up to the table and ignoring me said, how is she alone? She can't be alone as she doesn't know her mind. I have worked with these type of people before. These people do not know their mind, they are mental. She was young, quite attractive, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Who are you with, said the man, anxiously. He had been so kind. He was in his late thirties. I gestured to him in between mouthfuls to please go and sit with his friends. Who is with you, the girl asked again. I am on my own, I said with great conviction but it was useless. One little finger. 142. Can I see your bag? She asked me loudly, as if I was deaf. No you can't, I said. I really felt like an old woman who refuses to part with her bag. There was something about not wanting to part with one's bag, it was like someone taking your independence. I am okay. Please don't worry. I am fi any on my own, I said forcefully, but it was pointless, as she obviously did not understand my speech. I am going to call the management, the bossy girl said to her man friend forcefully. Reluctantly, I let go of my bag and took out my purse. My purse had only the cards of my Bombay address, which was probably a good thing. Are you a writer? Asked the man. Yes, I said. At last I thought that they had understood that I had not got a mental problem. I ate a few mouthfuls and thought all was fi any with the world but not for long. Miss Bossy Chops returned. I am going to go call the management. I know what these. People are like they don't know their minds, she repeated. Someone must be with her. She can't be on her own. I have worked with these mental people. It can be very dangerous, the girl said as she got up. One of the UCL security guards with his radiophone came with the girl. No one has reported her missing, the security man said, but we will look after her. With that, she made her exit. The security guard hovered around but soon left realizing I was just finishing my lunch. What a traumatic episode. I had been living in the institute's premises for over five years, where I Empowerment in academia 143 Had become quite well known. Nobody had been so offensive. There was nothing I could do but grin and bear it. I never went to UCL again. I related the episode to my friends that evening. Society here is so used to seeing disabled people being accompanied by their attendants. They did not know what to do with someone like you who was unaccompanied and needed help, analyzed Greg. My friends, Diana and my parents were furious when I told them. After reading extensively, I found my niche. I began to intermingle episodes of my life with feminist theories. It was to see my own life as compared to non-disabled women. For one of the seminars, the topic was difference and diversity. The word difference is being used to describe the difference between women themselves as well as differences between the two genders. Initially, women's studies implicitly was meant for only white, middle-class, heterosexual, able-bodied, western WOM. An Women's studies previously did not explore women from different classes, ethnicities, color, disability, sexual preference and age. 
The course enabled me to discover more about myself as a disabled woman. I read more and learned how disabled women were disempowered. My tutors Diana Leonard, Debbie Epstein, Elaine Unterhalter, Jenny Corbett, and Eva Garmanico gave me the confidence to question what I did not understand. They also motivated me to read more on women with disability and wanted to know about my experiences as a disabled woman. I started talking and asking questions in class. It was the Phi RST time in my academic life in higher education that I had a one-to-one -one independent relationship with my two tours. They got to know and understand my speech. The system. One little finger. 144. Of teaching was very informal. It was more of discussion and of course, we were put into small groups. Being in a small group, I talked and participated more. During my Phi RST year, Diana Leonard organized a meeting of all the faculties at the institute in which I was going to be participating. The library and the computer center began to be particularly attentive to my needs. In the four years of my stay, there was a change in attitudes. Modify cations were made to the stairs, which were not accessible, a stair lift was put in making the canteen and the bar accessible. These changes were implemented for one student, me. I remembered the terrible times I had in India with no ramps, no toilets or access to libraries and the canteen in St. Xavier's. As the course progressed, I focused on my individual experiences as a disabled woman. I identify Ed with the writings of an author called Jenny Morris, who was a leading disabled feminist. In Britain. I agreed with some of her theories. Before Morris B. Came disabled at the age of 21, she was actively involved in the women's movement and the labor movement. Trying to make sense of her new identity as a disabled woman, she put her own personal experience into a broader framework, thus making it political in keeping with one of the central themes of feminism, that personal is political. By personal is political, she referred to how a disabled woman copes in her everyday life and the relationship of this with the outside world. A disabled woman might need help with personal care, housekeeping, support with child care, and a number of other responsibilities that a non-disabled woman would take for granted. This did not mean that it was her private individual problem. Society and state needed to. Empowerment in academia. 145. Address this. As without the help and support of care staff, disabled people would just have to stay at home. Personal is public. What well-known feminists with disability ties have done is to publicize their own personal experience and put them in a wider context. This wider context makes personal assistance a matter of social concern, a social issue rather than a private and individual one. A disabled person must have a professional life. The amount of personal assistance would be decided by the social services. Again, if there are no disabled-friendly toilets in a public place where disabled people visit, the issue becomes public impinging and restricting a disabled person's life. These issues concerning disabled people are not merely individual and personal, they are public issues which need to be politicized. If there is no ramp in certain places, it is not a personal problem, but a larger problem which affects all disabled people, not only me. Having access in certain places is crucial not only for disabled people but mothers who have small children in prams, senior citizens, people who have just had accidents, etc. Other feminists also suggest that being both disabled and a woman is a double disadvantage, which means that women with disabilities have to struggle with the oppression of B. ING a woman in a male-dominated society, as well as the op. Press down of being disabled in a society which is dominated by able-bodied people. Through reading, I found out that there was a cultural association to disability with dependency, childlikeness and helplessness. A disabled man on the other hand is viewed as a wounded male, while a disabled woman is not able to fulfill the cultural expectations. She suffers again due to the cultural stereotypes associated with women being caregivers. One little finger. 146. Even the media portrays that the common role of most women is of a primary caregiver in a family. A woman needs to have characteristics of nurturance, warmth, tenderness and compass shown. Other duties that a woman is required to perform include child care, spouse care, cooking, feeding, soothing, nurturing a relationship and patching up tiffs within the family system. The stereotypical thinking is that women with disabilities are unable to provide this kind of nurturance for a man, nor are they able to satisfy his sexual and emotional needs. I have no ties that it is easier for a disabled man to get an able-bodied partner because society is conditioned to having and seeing women doing most of the housework, it is unheard of men doing all the housework or being positioned as a carer. I also learned about the body beautiful concept. Tradition ally, women are only considered to look beautiful and that is. It. Most men desire their women to be attractive and beautiful. As far as a disabled woman is concerned, she always gets unoticed because her body is different. An American feminist writer and researcher, Susan Rendell has called it a rejected body. Thoughts that occurred to me at that time were about some of my failed relationships with men. They must have only seen my body and rejected me. I have had a hard time accepting that I am trapped in a rejected body. A body that is not sexually attractive. Some people argue whether sex is that important. Well, in Xavier's I have studied psychology. Sex is a basic physiological need that even animals have. Like any other person my age, I adore romances. Being in the mainstream of life, one sees a lot of images of a man and a woman together. As I grew older, I naturally desired sex and a relationship. Like most women, sometimes I crave to be in the arms of a man. Most men look at me as asexual. Empowerment in Academia 147 I actually found that society also assumes that disabled women should not have sexual urges, should not even think about sex. How dare we let our thoughts go that way? 
What an indication of deviance. Society thinks that it is enough to include disabled people, but what about including their physical and emotional needs? It is crazy but society on one hand thinks that disabled people should lead normal lives, but when it comes to the crunch of having an intimate relationship with a person who is disabled, they get scared and pretend that the problem is not theirs. The thought of having an intimate relationship with someone who is different does not even cross their minds. Disabled people are often kept at a distance, as the so-called normal people think that becoming involved with a disabled person would be an onerous situation. My article No Sex Please You're Disabled, in the Metropolis on Saturday, September 1996 had alerted the public that people with disabilities were not children anymore, we had thoughts. Two, which could be adult thoughts, desires, feelings, passions and expectations like any other non-disabled person. Like everyone else, I did have the desire for sex. Once when I brought up the subject, people around me started whispering, and I was told why would you need sex? That was the reaction of some of those who called themselves professionals of the spastic society. I thought of how they lived in tiny boxes, and how small their spaces were. I promptly wrote an article, No Sex Please, You Are Disabled, a takeoff from a famous comedy I had seen in London of No Sex Please We Are British. Did it make an impact? I do not think so. I did have outbursts as at times I found life extremely painful. During those moments I collapsed in tears but I always. One little finger. One hundred and forty eight. Chose the night and cried quietly. My mother says if she asked me why I was crying I would usually say, you know why. She too would go away and cry. When I am in an emotional state, I cannot figure why the tears keep rolling down, I cannot control them. Of course, I have normal desires that are hidden, and left in a box with a lid never to be opened. But sometimes, the lid slips open and the tears are let loose. It is but natural that I ask myself will I be like everyone else? Will I be normal? It needs a lot of grit and determination to be different and stand out. I am determined to fight GHT and win. The positive side in me takes over and I keep those painful thoughts away from plaguing me. One such episode occurred after I returned from my cousin Aditi's wedding to call it. I was staying with Kaka and Brinda. I collapsed into F of tears for no apparent reason. After an age, my uncontrollable tears stopped and I tried to verbalize. My emotional outbursts of needing a partner, like most people. Around me. Both Brinda and Kaka, poor things were shocked and did not know what to do or say. Yes I agree with you. You should satisfy your sexual needs, said Brinda. But of course no one knew how. Weddings tended to have that effect on me as they were a reminder that I possibly would not ever share such an equation with someone. I must say, I was better during my brother Nikki's wedding to Natasha. I had become more detached. I did not anymore think the only way forward was marriage. Also Natasha, now of course my good friend, being American, having been exposed to. Empowerment in Academia 149 Disability much more than an Indian woman, is very inclusive. She includes me automatically, not needing to be prompted. As time progressed, I began developing a close emotional relationship with a close male friend online. The other thought that I learned and of course experienced, is that disabled people, are looked down upon as a burden on society. Susan Wendell writes that any society despises an adult who needs help to eat, wash and to use the toilet. She also goes on to say how the same culture promotes the self-deception that independent adults do not need another's help, and IG nor the thinking that we are all profoundly dependent on one another. Everyone is interdependent. If one lives in a family for example, be it if one has a disability or not, we are all in a way interdependent or codependent, socially, emotionally, physically and intellectually. Are not we dependent on the plumber, the electrician, the computer technician? To give my own example, while my mother was doing her doctorate, we used to share the household chores. While I did all the outside chores like the shopping, the laundry, posting letters, she did all the cooking and cleaning of the house. We were both codependent. She was dependent on me, little old me. In my opinion, to ignore this factor of codependency would be to move towards a most self-centered, self-focused world and ignore the support that people like me give. I buried myself into the master's program. As I kept read ing and discussing concepts during my master's, it gave me more confidence and self-esteem. It was the best time of my life. This was the FIRST time, I was analyzing myself and the outside world. I got the opportunity of developing a wide circle. One little finger. 150. Of friends and having deep relationships with women the same age as me. Some of them are Miriam Mariso, Patricia Smith, Anita Mather, Camilla Usmani, Katya Burton, Helen Polson, and of course Susan Kearney, who my closest friend. All of them were very keen about their careers, they did not come from a male-dominated society. By interacting with them, I was able to broaden my knowledge and enrich my life. With feminism came the understanding that it is crucial to start from the knowledge of our everyday experiences to develop a broader picture and understanding of the oppression of women. This expanded to a recognition that this applies not only to generic women's oppression but also to the different experiences and ways in which different groups of women, including women with disabilities, are oppressed. Living on one's own with friends, being accepted for what I am and learn ing, boosted my confidence and empowered me. It made me believe in myself that I can be included in the mainstream of life despite my disability. My one small fi inga did not let me down. I became quite adept and fast in writing essays and keeping to deadlines. Only it was slow and laborious. I found the four years intellect to ally invigorating and emotionally empowering. Were it not for my friend Greg and my mentor and guru Diana, 
I would not have gone through this meaningful and stimulating period which brought me to the crossroads of life, as I began to case tie in myself in terms of who was I. I was, for the Phi RST time, able to accept my own identity as a disabled woman, and was proud of being one. 151. Living on one's own. My road to independence and living alone started when I came back to London with my mother in 1996. I was able to master the daily chores as everything was so accessible and everybody around was eager to help. Klaus has invited us for a weekend, said mother one day, stirring the pasta sauce. Why don't we go, dad asked. Please, can I stay on my own, I pleaded. You can't stay alone, mother said promptly. My friends, Helen and Keith are coming. I will ask them to stay on a little longer, I said confidently. Helen and I had gotten to know each other in Oxford. She used to teach at the Polytechnic. After we were introduced, it did not take us long to become good friends. Helen was a poet. How do you know if they want to spend the entire weekend with you, mother inquired. I will find ND out, I said. I dialed their number. Hello, said Helen. Hello, Helen. It's me, Molly. Mithu and Safi are going. Away this weekend. Would you like to come and spend the weekend in London? I asked. We'd love to, said Helen, sounding very pleased. Mother was hovering near the phone. One little finger. 152. Can I speak to her, asked mother, not trusting that Helen had gotten the right message. I handed the phone to mother. Hi Helen, Safi and I are going off for the weekend and Malini was wondering if you would like to spend the weekend with her here in London. Do parents realize how overprotective they are? Yes, we would love to, said Helen. Then what time do you think you will come, asked mother. We will come by six o'clock, said Helen. Where will you meet them, asked mother, as usual anxious and micromanaging. Don't worry, I'll send them an email and we'll meet them at the institute foyer, I said. Okay, that seems to be a good arrangement, said mother. I uttered a shriek of joy. This is very characteristic of me. When I am pleased, I shriek with delight. For the Phi RST time, I was going to be alone in London with my friends. On Saturday night, we decided to stay in, watch a video and experiment with our cooking techniques. Molly, where's the oven switch? Helen asked. It should be there, I said getting up in my walker trying to look but failing to locate it. These are practicalities I had no knowledge of. Keith, can you come here and help us fi ND the oven switch? Commanded Helen. Helen was essentially a feminist but a great householder. Poor Keith was enjoying a few minutes away from the ladies, reading the newspaper. Okay coming, said Keith. Living on one's own. 153. It took us the next 15 minutes to fi ND the switch. This was a completely new learning task for me. Dinner is ready, said Helen. We had a lamb casserole, garlic bread and salad, not to miss a bottle of Chianti. For dessert we had a lemon meringue pie. When we were going to bed, I thanked Helen. Wouldn't you do the same for me, she said as she helped me put on my pajamas. I nodded and would always remember our conversation. We had a lovely weekend. My mother and dad looked extremely refreshed when they returned. Must make them get away more often, I thought. I was happy that they were back but glad that I had had some time alone with my friends. Soon I had another occasion to be alone. Mother and dad were needed in India. They would be gone for six weeks. It was pointless for me to go and come back. It was also too expensive. It was the monsoon season in Bombay, and after my newly found freedom, I found the thought of go. ING back to India unappealing, as I would be trapped at home. Most of the time. Mother please, I will be able to manage. Let me stay in London on my own. This was a difficult request for my mother. Most of the time that I spent away from them was carefully structured, and to leave me alone in London was not going to be possible. What if something happened to you? What if you became ill, mother said. Nothing will happen to me. Don't assume the worst, I begged. I could be very obstinate, and once I made up my one little finger. 154. Mind, I hated to budge from my decision, one of my disability ties among many. Let's see, said mother as she ironed some of our clothes. The conversation for the next few days always centered around the subject of whether I was or was not to be left alone in London. Two weeks later dad asked mother, darling, how many tickets shall I book? I think two. Malls is very keen to stay, and we have to respect her wishes. Mother was essentially hugely democratic, though she loved structure and organization. On hearing this, I instantly gave her a big hug. This time, I asked my friend Claire to stay with me. She came over to discuss her stay with me. The previous night, mother had cooked a vegetarian meal. Claire loved Indian kana, food in Hindi. Claire and I had met through our mothers who were good friends. Her brother Charles also had cerebral palsy like me and coincidentally, we were in the same school, both in. Shane and Delaru. While we were in Shane our mothers. Shirley and Mithu became close friends. When we returned to England this time, we met up after 20 years. They reintroduced Claire and me. When Claire and I met, we bonded immediately and became good friends. It was at this time Claire was forming a group called Project Discover. The aim of this group was to create a virtual environment for disabled people. She and I spent hours working on proposals. 
At the dinner table, as we discussed the details of Claire's stay ing with me, mother repeatedly asked, will you be able to manage alone? We both assured her that we would. The day arrived for mother and dad to depart. Will you be okay, asked mother for the tenth time, as she put her last ES centials in her suitcase. Yes, of course, I assured her. Living on one's own. 155. By that time, I was trying to keep a brave face. We walked down the stairs. I was painfully slow as it is, but today I was doubly slow, as I was a bit on the teary side. I guess when one is emotional their balance gets slightly affected. Bye, said dad as he kissed me, adding, this is what you wanted so don't cry. Men do not understand why women cry. Bye, said mother through her tears, as she hugged me goodbye. Her dark glasses were on. She always put them on when she cried. The minicab drove off to Heathrow Airport. To soothe my emotions, much like the English do, I indulged in a cup of tea. I found a cafe at Russell Square where I sat quietly and dried my eyes. A mixture of emotions passed through me. I was happy to be finally on my own, but sad that my mother and dad had left. We did so much together. We were more like friends. As I zoomed around on my own, I met so many different kinds of people. People usually would come up to help or to. Converse which, though on a superficial level, made me feel. Good as I felt included. After my cup of tea at Russell Square I decided to check my email. Are you a student? asked an attractive Asian girl. I was searching for a computer to do some internet browsing. It was August. All computers were occupied as the MA students needed to complete their dissertation. No, I confessed. Then what are you doing here, she said trying to be fired, sir. My mother is doing her PhD, and I wanted to use a computer, I said shyly. These computers are only meant for students, she said. I gave her one of my sweet, angelic smiles. Okay. Just this once, she said. One little finger. 156. What's your name, I asked Camilla. Yours, she said it was through such interactions that I came to know more and more people, which served to reinforce my independence. I realized that I need not be so apprehensive of managing without mother and dad, and that I would be just fine. any. Claire moved in that evening. One evening, Claire asked me, Malls, who does the laundry? I do it normally, I said. I told Stella, my carer, to put the laundry bag on my wheelchair, and I whizzed off to Brunswick Square. I dumped the laundry and easily found someone to help me put all the laundry into the washing machine. I told Claire about this. I am impressed, Claire said as she came in from work. For my care, I had two people, one came in the morning and helped me with my bath and getting ready, and the other came in the evening to help with dinner. For the fire RST time, I had to cook for myself as my evening care came from Nigeria and knew how to make only Nigerian. Food. I used to tell my carer what I wanted and how to make it. By telling her exactly what to put into the dishes. It was a step-by-step -step cooking process and she greatly enjoyed it. My cooking was not great but it was edible. I made meat sauce and pasta on a regular basis in those days. Pasta was considered to be a wholesome, student-friendly of meal. Let's have a party, said Claire one day. Okay, I said. It was the end of summer. We managed to squeeze in about 30 people in our small FL at. Shall we open another bottle of wine, suggested Claire. It was about 10.30 p.m. We felt we had not had enough so we. Living on one's own. 157. Opened another bottle. It was a disastrous decision. We both took two or three sips and got hopelessly sick all over the carpet. Our intake of alcohol was obviously a trifle e too high. The tedious task was to quickly remove the stain and the smell. Six weeks passed without any hassle, and I managed just fi any. Mother and dad returned from India, and we soon settled back into our routine. Unfortunately, soon afterward, my aunt got very sick, and mother had to return to India again. Dad was in Bombay at the time. Malls, Mashi is in intensive care, mother informed me as I sat down. Mashi was my aunt's sister. Mashi and my relationship goes back to the day I was born. When I was born apparently I spent a signify scient amount of time with her. When we moved to Cambridge, she helped mother to take care of me. Until I was 22 I did not have a carer. My personal needs were taken care of by my mother and members of the family. As my mother and my aunt were getting older, Mashi only suggested that I should have a separate carer. Her stroke was a big and tremendous tragedy in our lives. Mother's face was red as she had been crying. Her eyes had dark circles too, as she had limited hours of sleep since she came back from India. She had finished her 100,000 words thesis. It was phenomenal as she took only two and a half years to complete her PhD which usually takes a minimum of five e years. But her viva was yet to happen. You come after the viva, said Mesho. We spent a fortune on phone calls. Ma, don't worry. You go after your viva. I will come a bit later. I said bravely as I counseled her. One little finger. 158. Who will stay with you, mother asked. One of my friends, don't worry, now I am a student, I know quite a few people, I said in my confident way. After all I was now a qualified ed student. I had nothing to fear. Previously, there was a nagging worry about whether or not I will be asked, who are you, and what are you doing? As soon as I became a student I got more confident and found out my rights. I will fi nd someone, I said. My formula of living alone was to carry on with the carers and have a friend to share the fl at. 
This had worked. So I rang up my friend Charmaine. Within a day, Charmaine said yes. Mother F.L.E.W. to Delhi after her viva, and Charmaine, and her sister stayed with me. Sweetie, what shall we have for dinner, said Charmaine. Shall we have homemade pizza? Sounds lovely, but how, said Charmaine. I have bought pizza bread and the ingredients. All you need to do is to pop some vegetables on top of the pizza bread and then add the cheese. Don't we put cheese before, said Charmaine. Yes, sorry, my cooking skills are elementary, I confessed as I sipped my wine. Charmaine prepared the pizza and put it in. The pizza was ready within minutes. It looks brilliant, I said as I bit into a piece. You have good cooking skills, Charmaine exclaimed. So do you, I said, as we chomped on our pizza, very satisfied with life. We patted each other on the back for our successful attempt at homemade pizza. Meet me at the Institute of Education, IOE, bar. I am invit ing some friends, said Miriam, one of my classmates. Miriam. Living on one's own. 159. Was half Ethiopian and half Italian. Within a couple of weeks, Miriam and I had become good friends. Okay, I said, rushing to hurriedly complete some Christ Moss shopping on Tottenham Court Road as I was leaving for India the next day. I arrived at the IOE bar with bags in my wheelchair. These are my friends, Susan and Camilla, said Miriam. After a while Miriam drifted to another table with her friends. You have been doing a great deal of Christmas shopping, said Susan as she noticed a considerable amount of bags at the back of my chair. Yes, I am leaving for India tomorrow and these are Christmas presents, I said. We had a good evening. What was unique about that evening was that we chatted and had a great deal of fun. I think what I intently love about friends is that they fi rst see me as a person and then my disability. This is one of the main reasons why we remained friends for the next 12 years. When I returned from India in early January, I was alone for a brief period of two weeks. I organized a student every night to come and stay the night with me as the higher OFFI Sials did not want me to sleep the night alone in case of a fiery. After I returned, I kept bumping into Susan and Camilla at lunchtime. At that time they were both assistants to Professor Angela Little and Elaine Unterhalter, respectively. Susan and Camilla threw a party for the students in their department to which I was invited. Why don't you come for a cup of coffee? I asked them one day. Okay, they said. They came and we ate, chatted and laughed. We discovered that we gelled extremely well, laughed. One little finger. 160. At the same jokes, shared the same interests and liked the same Phi LMS. We are having another party, so we are doing some shopping, they said as I bumped into both of them in Brunswick Square one day. I will help you, why don't you put your shopping bags on my wheelchair? I said. A very good idea, said Susan, who liked taking the easy way out. Whenever they had parties, I would go along with them and my wheelchair would carry all the goodies with surplus bottles of wine. Susan and Camilla got attuned to my speech very quickly. I have realized that some people have a quick knack of understanding my speech. Are you free on Saturday? Why don't we to go to a movie? I said to Susan and Camilla. I am free. Let's go to Renoir, there's a French Phi LM on, said Susan. Yes, let us, I said. So, we went. In those days the Renoir was inaccessible, so Susan helped me walk down the stairs. As months went by, we became inseparable. Once I had gone in to have a quick chat and a cup of tea during OFFICE. Hours, which they did not encourage, as Professor Little came out to where the OFFICES were located, I made a quick dash. My exit was quite obvious. Being on a wheelchair one can be so conspicuous. There is nothing subtle about me. All three of us became extremely close. I am going to Paris with the students, said Susan, do you both want to come, she asked Miriam and I. Yes, I would love to, I said. Living on one's own. 161. When I told Dad, he thought about it for a while. Well, if Miriam is going, then you can, said Dad. We scheduled a visa appointment at the French embassy for the next available night. Susan and I booked one of those dial cabs to take us to the French embassy. Unfortunately, we had some bad luck. My electric wheelchair broke down in the middle of the road. I had to convey to Susan where the free wheel was for the electric wheelchair. The situation was dangerous as cars were zoom ing past us. I think Susan got frightened of using the electric wheelchair. She preferred me in a manual wheelchair. What? You girls could not manage to get the visa, Dad said picking me up from the IOE bar. No, said Susan. We all grinned to mask our nervousness. Okay. I will go tomorrow, he said. The next day as he walked in through the door I asked, did you get it? Yes, I got it. Unlike you girls, I managed to get it. Camilla and I traveled together on the Eurostar. We discovered that Eurostar offered a deal whereby one's carer gets half price. Both Miriam and Susan were delighted with such a scheme. On arriving in Paris, Camilla and I shared a room with Miriam and were going to meet Susan the next day. Camilla helped me take a shower and get dressed. It was good to give Miriam an extra pair of hands to help look after me. On that trip we had an advantage in that Miriam and her brother spoke FLU in French. My friends who were vegetarians were shocked when I ordered frog legs and shoved slithering snails down my throat. Malls, do you really want to eat this? Susan said. She always hoped that I would become vegetarian. One little finger. 
162. Yes, it is delicious. Why don't you have one? Be adventurous, I said to the others. They shook their head and refused. I felt like a carnivore as everyone watched me munch on frog legs. Paris was beautiful and snowy. As we walked around the Notre Dame area, snowfall aches fell on us. The holiday was splendid. For me, it was absolutely heavenly and wonderful to be with peers who were my own age. The Paris holiday was the Phi RST of many. Today, it is an annual practice for us to go somewhere together every year. I usually am the initiator and the organizer. The holiday is decided upon when I hit London for the summer. mare. So far, we have been to Edinburgh, Devon, Uppsala and Goa. We discovered steep hills in Edinburgh and Devon. Both Susan and Camilla pushed my wheelchair up the steep hills together. After that holiday, the poor things needed another one. In Goa we came across the potholes of Baga Beach and the stairs of the locals. Either they were gaping at my wheelchair or Susan's body, Susan in her swimsuit, was very sexy for the Indians. I will always cherish my holidays. It is superb to be with people one's own age even for a short time. As time progressed, I was becoming more and more independent, staying back while my parents traveled, taking holy days with friends. I was glad that I was no longer so dependent on my parents, and if need be, they could leave me home alone without worrying about me. One evening we got another terrible news. Alma had passed away in June 2001. It was devastating for us. Alma was dad's mother. After her husband died, she had living on one's own. 163. Led a very independent and empowered life. Alma was a professional cook for 40 years. When she became a widow, she fiercely guarded her independence. Dad was very quiet and upset. Nickel had spoken to him and had taken charge of Alma's body. Malls, I have got a ticket for tomorrow morning at 8. Will you be all right on your own? Dad said. Don't worry, I will get my friend Katya to come and be with me, I said. Katya lived on campus. Are you sure? Asked Dad. Looking back, I realize how significant my newfound independence was. Had I not been able to manage on my own, mother and dad would have had the added burden of tending to me at such difficult times. I rang up my Mexican friend Katya. Katya, can you come at 5 e? My parents have to leave for India, and I explained what had happened. Realizing it was an emergency, she came at 5 e in the morning. I would also like to tell Greg. I will feel more secure, said. Dad. As usual he was being overprotective. Sometimes it was. Irritating but sweet too. After a day or two Susan moved in. We spent six weeks together. It was a difficult time for the family and Susan, and I tried to keep busy and not think about it too often. We went for walks, ate out a great deal, and talked at length. In the mornings, the BGs or ABBA was invariably on as we got ready for work. Each day as she left for work, the song Trag Eddie played, signifying how she felt about work. One day I asked her, why are you with me most of the time? One little finger. 164. I like difference. It attracts me. I had gotten used to living with Susan and was in a sense, a little sad when dad came back and she had to move out. Emotionally, I was happy with Susan, and it was an idyllic period of my life though it was also a difficult time. My next FL at mate was Varsha, my close friend who worked for ADAPT. She had come to London to do her master's, which was partly from the Institute of Education and partly from a Canadian university. She brought her daughter Simran with her. Simran was five ve and a half. As I was writing my dissertation, I did not have any classes in the evening. I micromanaged every activity so that she was ready before her mother came back home at night from the library. My Phi RST experience of motherhood was in looking after Simran's needs. 165. What? A second. Masters, unbelievable. After the Phi RST masters, working at the Institute's library was ideal for me. With all the information computerized, one could communicate and interact through the internet, and so not very much speaking was needed thank goodness for technology for people like me who needed wheelchairs for mobility and computers for communication. I had a special corner which I considered mine. I buried myself for a year in the library. I had to complete four assignments for the master's program, which was the requirement for the university. Each assignment need add an argument which was crucial, a reference to all the current writings on the subjects, and a detailed bibliography stating all sources of information. All this with one fiinger. What people did in an hour, I took an entire day. So it was nose to the ground hours in front of the computer. Socially, I did well. Despite my poor speech, I had a knack for networking and making friends easily. I smiled and maintained. I contact and could quickly develop a friendship. As months passed, I had become friends with a few of the library staff. Why don't you become a librarian, said Gwyneth, one of my librarian friends. You could come and go whenever contniant. You will have FL exible hours. One little finger. 166. I would love to, I said. I was told again. Why don't you do a course in becoming a librarian? You know Victoria is doing the course next year, said in Peter's a good friend, head of information services and the library at the Institute of Education, very sound in her advice. And and I used to regularly meet for a cup of coffee and a chat. I shared this with my parents. 
Mother who had been think ing that I needed something more professional said, okay, if that's what you really want to do. I was not completely sure myself, so I took a year off. I spent my time in three different libraries, two of which were in Bombay, and one in Canada. I spent a week in the University of Prince Edward Island in which my friend Vian Timmons was vice president of the university. While I was in Bombay, I divided my time between the British Council Library and the library at the American Center. There was much discussion amongst my inner circle of friends and family whether to do a second master's or not. The new buzzword in library science is information management. I did not need much speech as most of the informatian needed was on the World Wide Web. Why don't we check out the University of North London, I said to mother and dad. The reason I thought of this particular course at the London Metropolitan, University of North London, was because it was the latest course in librarianship. We set out to Ladbroke House, next to the Highbury Fi Elds in Islington, where the London Metropolitan University carried out some of their programs. It was a cold windy day in April. What? A second master's, unbelievable. 167. 2005 A trek from Pimlico to North London quite rightly described by Elliot in Wasteland as the cruelest month, weather-wise. I was interviewed by Sue Bately who was the course leader and later became my personal tutor. Looking through all the paperwork and my CV, which now looked quite robust, she said, you will have no problem getting in as you have already got a master's, but fi LL in the application form. She asked me a few questions and I replied on the voice synthesizer. After a while she said, you are in and will send you the formal letter. I was allotted a two-room FL at in Holloway. The residence known as the arcade on Holloway Road was hugely accessibly, different from the IOE. The FL at made me really feel free. The toilet was spacious, large enough for a wheelchair to turn around, spacious bedrooms and kitchen. This empowered me further and enabled me to make quick decisions of moving. Around in the FL at itself. I could check what was in the fridge. And what I needed to buy. The London Met also had a special disability welfare OFFI Sir, who was hugely attentive to me. The only problem was transport. I had to change two buses to get to my college. I quickly got the knack of getting in and out of the buses. I stayed with a FL at mate called Gulab, who stayed with me for three months, taught me how to push and get onto the bus. Initially, I felt scared and reluctant to push my way. It took me a while. For the Phi RST few months I always had friends or my mother or Sathi or two FL at mates, Varsha and Gulab. Accompany me. Where have we come, said mother in her snooty way. She was only used to the posh parts of London. She said, this is. One little finger. 168. Spectacularly horrible. Holloway is associated with the famous Holloway prison. But Holloway grew on me and my friends. We adored the charity shops, the restaurants and a slower pace of life, not like the institute with its proximity to exciting Bloomsbury. Look at what we have here, said Susan as we moved into the red bar. The red bar looked pretty atrocious from outside but when we went inside, it was cozy and had blaring music on. The red bar served good Thai food right at the doorstep of the arcade. It had a great atmosphere with lively music. By the end of my stay, the red bar became an extension of our drawing room. Here, what do you want to eat? Susan said as she handed me the menu. Camilla, Susan and I used it a great deal to chill out. You will be a good trainer, said Richard Reeser who was in charge of disability, equality and education. Richard gave me a part-time job, whereby I was in touch with many disabled. Adults. I was given a personal assistant. I had to learn how to use a personal assistant at work. My job included formulating a database of disability trainers and giving training on disability issues and inclusive education. At the London Met, I noticed that most students were texting and using a mobile phone. Texting was beyond me because it involved such finite coordination, too fi ddly for me. But seeing my friends communicate at a fast pace and seeing it does not need speech, I was determined to learn it as it is the quickest way of keeping in touch with friends and family. Here are three different mobiles, I will leave them for you to try them out, said our friend Francis Cairncross. Francis. What? A second master's, unbelievable. 169. And Hamish also gave me a computer so I could work at home. They lived in Islington, a fashionable part of London, and hardly ever came to Holloway except now to visit mother and me. My one little Fi Inga did not adapt to these mobiles. It was a Saturday when, after saying goodbye to my friend Sumitra, I decided to go to the Carphone Warehouse, the mobile shop. I managed to convey my need to see a couple of mobiles. The shop assistant showed them to me. None of them suited my needs. I left after seeing every mobile. I felt bad at disrupting the shops. After spending ages fiddling around with my Indian mobile at night in my bed I got it. Poor Susan. I think she got innumerable SMSs in the beginning. The course at the London Met was a very professional one. All students were older than me, already in jobs and moving on to be librarians. The library and information profession was in a period of rapid change. New information and communica. Tie-in technologies have revolutionized the production, storage, retrieval and dissemination of information. The management of information services and the formulation of information policies of the organization are being constantly re-evaluated. We learned the differences between search engines and web directories. It taught an entire range of different and complex ways of searching from search engines. I also learned about the various information policies certain organizations have. 
The course concentrated more on management styles of functioning within a library, the various different methods of management. It taught me website design, setting up an intranet system. What attracted me to the course was that I had to do a six-week placement at any library. I chose LSE, as my friend Victoria worked there and also I went there often when. One little finger. 170. Mother was there. I did not think I would get in. I went for an interview with my friend Victoria. It certainly helped to have contacts and friends. I was interviewed by one of her colleagues called Beverly. The interview went well. I communicated with my lightwriter. I got the 5 VE week placement. I was thrilled that I would have a chance of working in LSE. I secretly hoped that I would get a job after my six weeks of placement. And I got in only using my lightwriter. I could see that attitudes towards people with disability were changing, even in the last 5 VE years. The 5 VE week placement was tough. I had to wake up at 7 o'clock. It was the heart of English winter. Stella my Kara came promptly at 7.30 a.m., after leaving her home at some unearthly hour to help me get ready. Poor Varsha, who was living with me for a term finishing her master's used to wake up early to help us as time was limited. She would make my lunch snack each. Day. The English weather made Varsha very depressed, poor. Thing. Stella and I would proceed to the bus stop for the good faith full old 91 bus which took us to Holborn and Portugal Street. The frequency of 91 was one in every 10 minutes. Very often, while waiting at the bus stop for the accessible 91 bus, it began to snow. There we would stand under umbrellas with snow around us everywhere. Beautiful but also physically strenuous. Varsha would always be prompt at picking me up in the evenings. We made friends on the bus. You are a wonderful person, said a passenger on the bus to Varsha, as she saw Varsha help me. God will bless you. Varsha and I secretly had a laugh, medical charity model we thought, anyone helping us disabled would be blessed. What? A second master's, unbelievable. 171. Varsha please let me go on the bus on my own. It's easy. There's no way I am going to let you go on the bus on your own, she said. I love Varsha, but she can be obstinate. I felt frustrated that I had someone with me all the time, as much as I like to be with them. I could never meet anyone spontaneously, and that depressed me. There was a short period of time, when I had to live on my own as mother needed to go back to India for her work. I was staying with friends, Camilla and Carol, who were students studying at the institute. They took turns to stay with me. Susan and Camilla were really overprotective, and were always ready to pick and drop me. But they had their own lives too. After all, I had mastered crossing the busy roads of central London. I had the freedom of crossing the roads, why could not I go in and out of buses by myself? The night before it was decided that when my lectures got over the next day I would wait for Camilla to come and pick me up. Things did not work out according to plan. Classes got over early. I decided to take the plunge and got into the bus on my own. There is a special space on the bus for wheelchairs and prams. The driver on seeing me brought the ramp out electronic alley. There were always many people around to help me get off and get on. I decided to go to Russell Square, the one area which had been home to me for nine years. It meant taking three buses. There were people in the bus whispering loudly as if I was hard of hearing, is she alone? Or how can she be alone? I heard two old ladies say, I thought them people were not allowed out alone. By the time they figured it out, I had reached my destination and indicated to the driver about needing the ramp. I zoomed out in my electric wheelchair, waved goodbye to the driver and one little finger. 172 proceeded to my destination. Traveling by bus did not need any speech. Being alone was terrifying. see. It allowed me to interact with the community. The experience cut out disability, the everyday experiences which non-disabled people take for granted. I was so used to being driven around by a chauffeur in Bombay and escorted in London. This was so novel, so exciting. I felt fantastic that I could travel on my own. I started going everywhere on my own, I went and browsed at bookshops at Regents, in Charing Cross, or just roamed around old favorite haunts like Russell Square, Regents Park and Tottenham Court Road. I loved Waterstones, Blackwell and Foils, they are my favorite places. I am a familiar 5G you there and would meet my friends there. Blackwell's is my favorite bookshop, it has comfortable lounges and a quaint area where you can finish a whole book and nobody would disturb you. Previously, friends came to meet me at one venue. Now, I could meet them anywhere. The feeling was great. Euphoric. Unfortunately, I had to learn the bus routes through mistakes. Once I was meeting an old friend in the Russell Square Cafe, then I had an appointment in Holloway. I took for buses to get to the OFFICE by mistake. My friend Michael Bach, director of Canadian Association for Community Living CACL, from Canada met me in Piccadilly and was intrigued and amazed at how well I knew the London buses and how I navigated through the busy West End. How I loved London. The freedom, independence and AC septance of people like me made me feel alive. Of course I got many SOS from home, mainly from my father and brother to say please take a cab. What? What? A second master's, unbelievable. 173. When my mother returned, she was usually in India but would come frequently for short stays, I slowly broached the subject that I had cracked the London's buses on my own. Ma, I will take you on a bus, I said. Yes, she was annoyed but her anger disappeared when she saw me hopping in and out of the buses with ease, and how many came forward to help. 
My mother had never traveled in a bus. Unbelievable, she took the underground usually. Pretend you don't know me and just observe how well the other passengers help me, I said to mother. Mother noticed that if the bus driver did not hear my buzz, the fellow passengers would tell the bus driver to stop and take the ramp out, and then I would zoom out and wave goodbye to the bus driver and the passengers. This indeed caused a chuck low. Mother and I began going everywhere together on buses. My two masters gave me confidence. I had to rely on myself. As my friends had full-time jobs. I had brought Vimla, my in. Jian Carer, but her knowledge of English was nil. It forced me to do more in London on my own. Why not check the facilities and attitudes toward disabled people further, I thought. The year at the London Met was very intensive. The assignments needed a lot of work, a lot of reading. After my master's in information management, I decided to spend the summer looking for a job from our tiny little FL at in Pimlico. Our FL at is very well situated overlooking the River Thames. Initially, it took me a while to settle down to life in Pimlico. It was a quiet life compared to the campus atmosphere both at the Institute and Holloway, Pimlico being hugely central. I loved it. The Battersea Park was just round the corner. I soon became known in the local shops of Sainsbury, Tesco. One Little Finger 174 The cultural hub which in the South Bank is about 40-minute Utes walk on the riverfront, a beautiful walk. I generally hung around there browsing through the second-hand books and seeing old French by LMS. I became an avid reader and a MEMBER of the local library. I chuckled with joy when I found my favorite romances. My uncle, Mesho, came for a meeting to London. I took him down the beautiful walk down Grosvenor Road to my old school at Shane Walk. I thought that after my two masters, I would surely get a job. But it was difficult. I applied for two jobs at the institute, one was for the post of a disability OFFI SER, and one was for a cataloger in the institute's library which I knew so well. I went to a debrief session and was told that I had the qualify cation but lacked experience. For the job of cataloging, one did not need speech. Nobody would give a job because of my speech. The catch-22 is that without experience, I would never get a job. But again clearly the institute was not ready for people like me. I did not get the jobs. I applied for many jobs. Some called me for interviews, some did not bother. I felt that my speech was the biggest barrier. The actual fact is that employers could see only my disability, not my capability. In any job, one requires speech and a limited amount of hand function. I did not get any job. It was a terrible period in my life. I thought, is this London, where I've grown up, studied? I have two moss. I got demotivated. It was the worst period in my life. I felt like a loser. Nickel kept telling me to write, and I decided to write. I had a mindset that I would never get a job due to the severity of my speech, it took me years to accept my limitations. I had come a full circle. I was faced with this again. So, being the What? A second master's, unbelievable. 175 Indian rubber ball I am, I bounced back. I put all my energy into writing. Dad, I want to do a course in Siddalit, I said browsing the website. What is the point of doing so many writing courses, said Dad as he accompanied me to enroll on yet another writing course. Writing courses help to bounce back ideas. You can't just sit and gape in front of the computer screen waiting for some brilliant brainwave to descend on you. Instead, I meet people and exchange ideas, I said with conviction. Okay, said dad. His okay was to really tell me to shut up as he went back to his favorite pastime of reading the economic times. We will go on Monday, he said. I was encouraged because in one of the Phi RST courses that I attended, Stacy, a fellow writer said to me, you are a writer Phi RST, and then you are disabled. Just what I needed to hear. I never did let my handicap get me down for long. I would always know how to enjoy life. On one occasion, I was feeling a bit bored with the humdrum of life, so I joined a Scrabble club, I managed to find ND1 online, at the Royal Festival Hall at South Bank. I went and began playing. To my glee, I came third, beating a few of the Brits at it. I developed a new technique of using the mobile as a communicator and this worked. Rather than lugging my big communicator along everywhere behind my back, I used my mobile. This summer when I was in London, I went to an Indian shop round the corner from our home in Pimlico. They obviously did not understand my speech, so I texted what I wanted to buy, par that's, and the shopkeepers immediately. One little finger. 176. Understood me and got them for me. They took the change from my purse and put the par that's in a plastic bag and bid me a friendly goodbye. I was having one of my boring days in London. I was browse ing through time out and spotted a new theater called Soho Theater. It was showing an interesting play. With my speech impairment and Vimla's lack of language skills, it doubly disabled me. I took my communicator and managed to get two tickets for Bobby and me. Bobby and Mashi were girl guides together at the United Nations. Bobby had been a friend of our family ever since I was born. A disabled person gets concise shown tickets at half price, and also for the attendant. Once I just felt like seeing a Phi LM, which Phi LM and where was unplanned. I jumped onto the usual 24 bus which stops outside our FL at in Pimlico. There was a bus divergence at Westminster so I had to get off. The whole of Trafalgar Square was being shut off. I slowly made my way to Leicester Square.
which was buzzing with life as usual. I went and wandered around. A film called You, Me and Dupree was on. I went and asked how much was the fare. They understood my speech. It was twelve pounds. No way was I spending that amount of money. I mumbled that I will come back instead. I went to Trocadero only to fi nd out that the chair lift was not working. I spied the Prince Charles Cinema Hall close by and noticed that there was a fi lm called Lake House that I wanted to see. It was my kind of fi lm, I waited around until the doors opened. I went up to an usher and told him that I wanted to see the fi lm and pointed to Lake View. The man called the fi lm attendant who quickly came. She was friendly. I bought my ticket and she told me to come back at 4 15 pm. I had half an hour to kill, so I went to. What? A second masters, unbelievable. 177. A bar called, all bar one and bought myself a Pim's number one. The waitress took the change from my bag. Then I began looking for the loose. The waitress apologized that there were no loose with disability access in that bar. So I went to the Mexican restaurant Chicoshio. Two men had to come out with a fold ing ramp. I felt bad about that but I went in, performed and came back. Then finally, I went to the Prince Charles Cinema Hall, where I was taken in. The Phi LM was good. To return home I hailed a cab and got in. Nearer home, I asked the cab driver to stop and I got out from the cab and paid the driver. He took the exact change from my purse. I asked him to help me put on my earphones of my iPod and off I wandered homeward bound. I walked home through the embankment. It was my favorite walk home, passing through the houses of Parliament Westminster Abbey, the embankment gardens, through Millbank Towers, through Tate Britain and Pimlico Gardens. And then home. I felt very happy with myself. Such magnificent architecture, bliss was it to be alive, but to be in London, was heavenly. My cousin Suro was with us for a while. I met him at Trafalgar Square. First question he asked me was, where is Vimla? He was really amazed that I had come there on my own. He had never seen me alone in his life. It was in 2005 that I started lecturing at the Institute of Educatian. My mind went back to a day when I was finishing my dissertation at the Institute of Education. Greg and I decided to have dinner out. Greg said in his usual loud fashion, shall we call Felicity? Felicity Armstrong is a prolific writer and academic on inclusive education. She was a renowned professor. She had written One Little Finger 178 Hundreds of articles on disability and particularly, the social model of disability. I thought to myself, would such a famous woman have dinner with us? I was envious at Greg as he lectured on the course. I wanted to but I thought my speech would be in the way yet again. I was getting a little disheartened. Everything needed speech and my speech sounded childlike and infantile. As soon as she met me she said, I have read your dissertation and liked it immensely. I would love you to give a lecture at the institute to my students. Wow. I could not believe this. I would be delighted to, I said. Though I was ecstatic I was going to lecture, I was but nervous because of my poor speech. I had learned to create PowerPoint presentations at the London Met, so I did not have to speak much and any friend could read out the contents. Sometimes I take a friend as an interpreter, so I took my friend Judy Larson. Judy had done her PhD with Moth. Oh but was especially friendly with me. She read out my power. Point presentations after which the students asked questions. I have now developed a lecturing technique of putting up my entire lecture on a PowerPoint. Yes, obviously I felt self-conscious of my speech. I absolutely abhor the sound of my monotonous voice. I wish I had a sexy, husky one with a clipped Oxonian accent, but I guess one cannot have everything in life. Students and academics are eager to know the inside perspective of a disabled person, from a disabled person. Anyway, believe it or not, I was a success. I began lecturing in India too. The current trend in the disability movement is for voices of disabled people to be heard. The next year, I was invited again. This carried on for five VE years. In the second or third year, there. What? A second master's, unbelievable. 179. Was a student from Paris who I had lectured to and who came up to me and said, will you come and give a lecture at the Sorbonne University Society? I could not believe this. No one in my family of Academy ICS had done this. Yes, I would love to, I said giving her a big smile. I thought it would never materialize, but it did. And and I exchanged emails back and forth during that year. Before leaving for London for the summer, I got my visa. My friend Teresa Fai led the visa form painstakingly. I went for the interview and got the visa. Hi, are you still interested in going to Paris? I asked Susan as we walked towards a pub near the Millbank. I have been invited to lecture at the Sorbonne. Yes, of course, I am definitely coming, she said. She said she will not be missing this opportunity. Dad bought the tickets for us. Mother came as well. We met Susan at Waterloo. She was on time for a change. I keep. teasing her about her punctuality. When I was in IOE I used to wait endlessly for her. However, she was on time, just about. We boarded the train, it had a portable ramp. I was traveling Phi RST, all disabled people are put in the Phi RST class with the attendant who was Susan. Mother smuggled her way into the Phi RST class. She said she would not need to eat or drink. The hostess smiled and said it was perfectly all right. 
You can get away with anything if you are charming. We were all given a glass of champagne each as we approached the Tour de Eiffel, including Mother. Paris is a walking city. One walks everywhere. This was the second time that Susan, Mother, and I were in Paris together. One little finger. 180. Mother had taken us when I had finished my Phi RST dissertation. We had three whole days of fun, just strolling around and imbibing the beauty. Our favorite place was the Rodin Museum, which had a beautiful cafe. My Sorbonne lecture took place on a Tuesday. We met and at 11 foot o'clock and went through my presentation. I was to have two interpreters. Susan was going to translate what I said in English, and was going to translate in French. We had a gourmet lunch which and took us for, and then we navigated our way to Sorbonne University. It was an old dilapidated building, hundreds of years old. We spent about 20 minutes just finding an accessible entrance. Eventually, we found the lecture room. The Parisian students rolled in one by one. My presentation began. It took 20 minute utes. After my presentation, the students all began to ask me questions. I then did the second 20 minutes. The lecture lasted. For one and a half hours. Questions kept coming. Some were personal, some were out of curiosity about the subject. None of the students had met a disabled adult. In the world today, there is a scarcity of a severely disabled people in the public domain. Previously, I used to get upset when people asked me how I coped with life as a disabled person, but as I got more empowered, I knew I will always be a rare specimen and so was always ready to respond to the questions. But the lecture confi remed that the world was beginning to accept us, they did not look at us as if we had come from Mars. Over the years Professor Armstrong or Felicity as she insist on being called, and I became good friends. Happy birthday, said Felicity as she kissed me. What? A second masters, unbelievable. 181. Let's go for a drink to the Russell Hotel, she said. On my 40th birthday, she decided to take me to the Russell Hotel. This was going to be a special treat. The Russell Hotel was a very expensive one next to Russell Square. The hotel had been the hub of the Bloomsbury Group, there was also a Virginia Wolf Cafe. We trotted off only to be confronted by stairs at the end. Trance. Do you have a ramp? asked Felicity politely. At the back of the building. Why don't you have a ramp at the front of the building? said Felicity. No, well it's an old heritage building. We can't afford to ruin the decor, said the porter. What an excuse. It's the law that every building in England should be Ashes Seibel, said Felicity. Nevertheless, we trudged to the back entrance and were taken up by the goods lift. My friend was seething with annoyance. She thought it was awful for disabled people to go up in a goods lift. We finally entered this grand building and walked to the bar which was really posh. The concierge came up and asked Felicity, how long are you going to stay? I was so used to being questioned by the normal world that I thought it was a perfectly normal case tie-in, but for my academic friend this question was outrageous, invading privacy. How dare they ask us how long we were going to stay? As long it takes to get drunk, answered Felicity, furious at their audacity at asking us how long we wanted to stay. One little finger. 182. Despite the initial hiccup, we had two glasses of champagne and ate some salmon, thoroughly enjoying each other's company. Thank you. That was the best treat I said for my birthday. Memorable. A wonderful 40th birthday with a wonderful friend, whose approach was always a level playing Phi ELD. 183. I get employed. Despite my two masters, I had not got a job in London, not through want of trying but I felt sure, because of my disabil ITY. Most jobs need speech and my speech was not the world's best. It goes without saying that I would have preferred a BBC accent. It was a warm September morning in 2006. I was ensconced in London, in my FL, at in Pimlico. I was half asleep, half awake. It was an unearthly hour in the morning, when I heard a MES sage on the voicemail. I couldn't believe what I heard. I replayed the answer phone to hear the melodious voice of my mother to make sure I was not hallucinating. I rang her mobile. She was in Delhi on work, staying at the India International Center where we usually stayed. Malls, I think you have a job. It's to be a senior events manager at the Oxford Bookstore in Mumbai, said mother excitedly. What I had heard was correct. The owner of Oxford Bookstore was very impressed with your CV and said that you are fully qualified ed to be an event. Manager, mother explained. Mother went on to explain about the job. I wondered how I was going to do the job with my poor speech. The more I heard, the more anxious I became. One little finger. 184. I had to go to Delhi for the interview. On the day before the interview, my whole family was giving me mock interviews. I think they were more nervous than me. On the day itself, I had two interpreters. Yes, I was nervous as we drove along the chaotic Delhi roads to the OFFICE in Aurangzeb Road. Atiyah and Varsha were with me. The interview lasted for about 45 minute utes. Preeti Paul, they were the Pauls of the APJ group, directed all the questions at me, which was a pleasant change. She seemed very liberal and enlightened. In fact, because she lived in London and India, like me, she was very open to giving me a chance. I got the job. In good old India. Unbelievable. The next thing was how would I be able to do the job. 
I was supposed to increase the footfalls, revenue, in the bookshop through book launches and interesting talks. I had to organize four events a week. It took me some time to network with O. Thors. This I did through chat, Facebook and email. Karuna. Put me onto Facebook, which revolutionized my life. My one little fi inger again came up tops. I was very successful. I had eminent authors and well-known citizens of Bombay responding to my emails coming into Oxford to talk about their books. Teresa, my friend, helped me as my assistant in making calls and negotiating with the authors. She had a lovely voice, spoke very well, and helped to coordinate whatever I direct and planned. It is vital for a disabled person to have an assistant. With an assistant, disabled people can perform the job to their fullest potential. In England and US, disabled PEOPLE have the service when employed. I know someone who had four, in the United States. I received a great deal of support also from my friends, Sumita Sun and Varsha Huja during the I get employed. 185 Events. I would develop an event, coordinate it, get it started in Sumita, and Varsha would be happy to introduce the authors and thank them on my behalf. Everyone accepted this as a norm. They realized that this was happening due to my poor speech. I interacted with my colleagues through Gchat. Dur ing my early days, there was a quick turnover of managers, I had a tough time convincing every new manager that I could think. It took months each time, after which it was time for the next change. I think what made a difference is that because I'd grown up here in Bombay, people knew me. Obviously I was popular, they liked me. Their response to the events I planned was very heartening. Through successful events, the elite and the Intel Ligencia saw that I had a brain. I bounced back to life. I had written a lot and of course I was not invisible. I was employable. After my return, I was also able to bring in attitudinal changes through the group, which I had early. A formed called ADAPT, an acronym for Able Disabled All People Together. The matter of rights of disabled people had taken a center stage all over the world. Disabled people today in the West were in the forefront of all decision making and were involved in the running of disability organizations. Nothing about us, without us was the current thinking all over the world. I had become the trustee of the organization which had 15 members on the governing body scrutinizing the society's functioning within the charity commissioner's laws. I decided to review the objectives of ADAPT. I had initially started it as a recreational club for people with disabilities and able-bodied people designed on the basis of the PHAB clubs. One Little Finger 186 In Britain When I left for England in 1993, the social meeting slowly dwindled down to no meeting. No one felt the need to activate it until 2000 when I returned to India again. In India, the Persons with Disabilities PWD, Act was passed in 1995. Both Mashi and Dad were instrumental and were a part of the formation committee. The aim and objective of ADAPT was to ensure accessibility, equal opportunity, equal participation as deaf in the PWD. After Mother's PhD, the Spastic Society of India had embarked on a project with Canada. The Indo-Canadian project dealt primarily with mainstreaming disabled adults and children into society to make it more inclusive. As part of the CA Nadian project, the society needed to form a disability activist group focusing on rights and entitlements, in keeping with the global trend, nothing about us, without us. What should be the topic of conference, asked Mother when we were discussing a conference to be held. Why not have it on the theme of citizenship, said Nilesh, who had been to school to the Center for Special Education with me and had read my essay on citizenship and barriers. Yes, a very good idea, said the group. Ninu and Sunita, women with disabilities, had joined our new group. The conference was a huge success. Michael Bach and Vian Tim Mons, our Canadian partners, along with Diana Leonard, FLEW down for the conference as did my uncle, Mesho, from Delhi. The outcome of the conference was the formation of ADAPT's rights group, ARG. This rights group differed from other disability groups in that ADAPT included both non-disabled and disabled people. We believe that both able and disabled should work together to form an inclusive society where all I get employed. 187 Are welcome and included. We activists strongly condemn the segregation of disabled persons in ghettoized, organized Italians, made up of only disabled people. We, the ARG team, believe that this attitude is yet another expression of exclusion that further hinders the creation of a truly inclusive society. The three main objectives of ADAPT were to initiate change in access, attitude and policy for people with disabilities in India. The central message of ARG has been nothing about us, without us. ARG recognized that without a wide collective recognition of people with disability and an acknowledgement of their human rights, there will be no public and political will or lobby for change. It was unanimously agreed that I become the chairperson of ADAPT, with Anita Prabhu as co-chairperson. Nilesh, Ninu and Sunita became founder members. Amina was appointed to build a database of the alumni. The most critical phrase of feminist theory and practice is Perhaps the statement that personal is political, that what happens in private is power-based and it should not be secret or concealed. It should be spoken about in public in a political manner and that collective action can be taken to change it. So I used my personal experiences of inaccessibility into the public forefront, getting more ramps and making Bombay more accessible. The achievements were made in various ways. We fi led many public interest litigations, PIL, against the state of Maharashtra for non-implementation of the Persons with Disability Act. We conducted access audits of public places, appealing to the authorities to make inaccessible places disabled-friendly. 
As a result of ARG's lobbying, hospitals, multiplex cinema halls, shopping malls and amusement parks became disabled friendly. One Little Finger 188 A personal touch of actually meeting the people concerned and talking to us helped. But there were terrible times too. Once I had gone shopping for Diwali with Pam. The shopkeeper banned my wheelchair in one of the sections of the shop saying that the shop was too narrow and wheelchairs were not allowed. Everyone stared at us at the entrance. It was a leading store in Breach Candy, Bombay. We left feeling very humiliated. But not for long. When we reached the Spastic Society of India they were outraged and in the next few days, we gathered together at least 50 people on wheelchairs and had a demonstra tie-in outside the shop. The Traffy C police supporting us, diverted the Traffy C, and the road outside the shop was pedestrianized. The shop did not know what hit them. Our demonstration was a huge success. The owner of the shop initially refused to come out, but with our shouting he came out and apologized. And said we were his children, and invited us, in all 50 of us. On wheelchairs. It caused immense publicity. We also got many calls from friends who had read about it in the press saying that it was the best thing we had done. Another example of our might was in 2005, a memorable year for us. In 2004, we were denied entry to the Mumbai Marathon. The rules stated, no wheelchair vehicles or dogs allowed on the course. Unimaginable but true. We began a huge agitation. My brother played a crucial role, he joined us and began fight guiding the authorities. We approached our patron, Mr. Sunil Dutt, who was then the sports minister at the center, and he was so upset about our exclusion that he promptly rang up the state sports minister. The marathon organizers were asked to stop the event, or include wheelchair users. On January 16, 2005, a landmark. I get employed. 189. Event allowed wheelchair participants to run the standard chartered Mumbai Marathon for the Phi RST time in India. Placards with UC Disability, I see Ability, UC A Wheelchair, I see Investment were all over the place. We have become quite well known now and quite feared as well with our demonstrations, lobbies, articles in the media, etc. I did not know I could be an activist. More recently, I have been focusing on empowering disabled people and sensitizing corporates to hire employees with disability. I wrote articles and brochures on Does Inclusion Matter? How inclusive are we? I targeted the electronic and print media. I began writing articles. Few of them are, are you alone, where is your helper, citizenship and the links between the different models of disability, does she take sugar in her tea, from charity to rights, a cross-cultural perspective, I may be different but aren't we all, society creates a norm and the norm excludes disabled people, voices of people in special schools, etc. For the organization, ADAPT, I used my internet skills, which had been honed in the course at the London Met and created a global internet chat forum. The forum provided a platform for sharing information and resources. This brought up issues of loneliness, marriage, sex and growing old without parents. I began designing a special empowerment course which is my interpretation of the new social model, where I combined my studies of feminist and disability theories. I put in law and disability. The empowerment courses are for people with disability with the aim of enabling everyone to understand good practices of inclusion and the Persons with Disability Act. One Little Finger 190 I began lecturing in the training and pedagogy department of ADAPT to students of the teacher training course and students of the Community Initiatives in Inclusive Education CIIE, coming from different parts of the world like Mongolia, Tonga, Chile, Bangladesh, Pakistan and of course, India. I began conducting empowerment courses in Bombay, Delhi and am doing one this year in Jharkhand and Gujarat. When I began lecturing in Bombay, students wanted me to present my lecture on a PowerPoint on my own, they said they did not require an interpreter. I am now thoroughly busy. I have the job at Oxford and my work with ARG. I am involved in my empowerment courses. Reflections 193. I have used the one little Phi Inger 50,000 times. This strenuous, exhausting, and exhilarating journey is coming to a close. My Phi RST book is almost over. Unbelievable. It has been an emotional upheaval revisiting my life. Now as I pen my last chapter, I am introspective. With a disheartening beginning as a child who got singled out, life has not always been a cakewalk. Yet I have surmounted many obstacles. The doctor who said I would be a permanent vegetable has had to eat his words. I have two master's degrees. I travel, write and lecture across India and abroad. I was asked to leave shops and canteens because I was in a wheelchair, but today I go shopping on my own in London and regularly eat out with friends at restaurants in Bombay, Delhi, Paris and London. They said I think these people should be locked up. Today we are visible everywhere, in movie theaters, restaurants, schools, universities, parks, you name it. Make it accessible. And you will see us there. Existing laws have ruled in our FA. Vor. While some nations honor and implement these laws and some do not, I stand witness to change, to insurmountable obstacles becoming challenges that can be conquered. We are not at the top of the mountain yet, there is much more to be done, but we are on the road, and now there is no stopping our journey. One Little Finger 194 I am thankful that my life and my body have made me philosophical. I think the art of living lies not just in confronting our troubles but minimizing them and focusing on the positive aspects of our life. Most of us are swimming against the tide of trouble in, what I think of as, the ocean of our life. Yet we need to survive, make it to the shore, and not let the waves engulf us. 
I feel I have managed to do that, with the steady support of my family who fought the battle along with me. The struggle to overcome adversity has made me a tough survivor in a family of brave soldiers. As I refl ECT back, I realized that the move to England was essential for mother and me to survive, and was a wise move on the part of my parents. It was also equally essential for us to return to India. Perhaps it was destined, as this return started the disability movement in India, and helped other disabled children gain access to education. I do feel you for it that my need for a special school has benefited Ted other disabled children in India. I write this last chapter as I sit in Russell Square gazing at the undulating grass, FL hours in full bloom, toddlers hopping in and out of the water fountain under the watchful eye of their mothers. I watch a boy playing in the fountain and wonder what life has in store for him. Behind me is Russell Hotel. It still seems inviting, with architecture that will always remain magnificent. The square looks ravishing. I think to myself, how I love nature and the peaceful beauty of London parks and this beloved square. How fortunate I am that my life has been an east-west journey, a privilege that not many have. My early link with the west was critical, and it greatly benefited Ted my growth and personality. It was in England that my parents found out. Reflections 195 I could think. In later years, it was the available communication technology and strategies in this nurturing environment, which empowered and helped me to overcome my communication difficulties, and also encouraged me to question. Learn ING about the latest social model of disability, and the Chong ING approach to the treatment of disabled people helped me to accept my own challenging situation and my body. Later in India, it helped mother and me to take the FL edgling disability movement forward. There is no doubt that my early and ongo ING exposure to the West has had a major impact on my growth and empowerment. Today my articles are published in the local papers. They educate the public, making them aware that disabled people are not children. Disabled adults have adult thoughts, desires, feelings, passions, views and expectations like other normal adults. But most of the time these desires remain unquenched. People are not willing to look past our bodies into our souls. People, especially in India, see us as children and children should not be heard. They look at our imperfect bodies and believe some of the religious beliefs which explain that we are the way we are, due to a retribution for past sins committed. I wonder seriously sometimes, what is the sin I committed? I must admit that in London, I am free of all this negative thinking. I do not feel so disabled there. I am independent. I go to the supermarket for the daily shopping, stop at the laundrette, the chemist, buy the best phi-sh for mother, a Bengali addicted to her mock or phi-sh, from the local farmer's market. Doing all this makes me so pleased with myself. That joy of freely moving around on my own, emotionally feeling needed, and of contributing, is immediately snatched away from me as one little finger. 196. I hit Bombay's dusty airport. There will be no more moving around on my own. The roads are full of potholes, there are hardly any pavements, most shops, libraries, theaters, cinema halls, restaurants, bookshops and museums are inaccessible. I know I will be paralyzed at home. There will of course be those whispers and piercing stares, Indians seem to have made staring a national habit. Those endless painful questions, the rejections. The little oppressions of not being able to converse with me or treating me as an outcast or an invisible individual will continue. I will still be looked upon as a child because of my speech and body. I want to scream and tell them that I am a 42-year-old woman. Attitudes do matter. They can make you feel included or exclude. Even today, many who do not know me or have never met a disabled person in their life will automatically address the person I am with. They will talk about me in front of me. But never with me. They will follow this up with can she hear? Does she understand or she went to Oxford? How nice. The conversation then comes to a screeching halt. They have not ing more to say. Even today, many will invite the whole family for dinner or a party but not me. Do they feel I am infectious? Are they ashamed? I yearn for my friends, my social network. I yearn for the people who accept me. I long to breathe. I long for the openness of life. Why do I feel so small, so isolated, so rejected in India? Why do I yearn after a few months to run back to where they treat me as a human being? Will I make it? Is a question that nags me. I get into a panic. Life means freedom. Freedom to think, move, speak, interact with whomsoever, freedom to make choices. Without this, it is not life. One does not live. One. Reflections. 197. Only exists. Getting back means the loss of it. Initially, there would be those tears. Gradually, I would begin to analyze, I would reason with my mind. Today, my mind takes over. I do not want to be normal. I feel just like everyone else, yet that does not seem to be the case in the eyes of this society. Previously, I would have liked to have got married. That was a period of normalization. I had to be normal. Foucault argues who is normal. And who is disabled? Who decides normal and abnormal? Are we conditioned one by society in the definition of what is normal? Do we only see it from society's perspective of normalization? Or can the definitions evolve as time goes by to include everyone? Is everyone perfect? I may never have a man to hold me or a child of my own and never be in a traditional situation. I realize I will always continue to struggle. Adjust to the reality of people shunning me will be a lifelong challenge. To minimize and to accept life as it is, is a discipline like yoga which I regularly do. 
I have grown and developed in an atmosphere where there has been control of thinking, of my own self, of the mind over the body, of the spirit over the physical, just so adequately put by Emerson. What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And those tears dry up. Having experienced acceptance and rejection, I turn to the positive aspects of my life. I tell myself how fortunate I am because not many can live the way I have and the way I do. I am fortunate to have friends who reach out to me and love me. I cherish those friends who love me just. One little finger. 198. The way I am. They do not try and make your kind of normal, which I can never be or may not want to be, because I do not know what your normal is. I know only me. I like me. I have learned to love and accept that life is beautiful as it is. It is not always easy, but definitely beautiful. I think that despite the attitudes of rejection, lack of access and the loss of freedom, I have accepted India as home. No matter how hard it may be to live in India, it will always be home, and I will always return home. I am comfortable now in the light and the dark, the smiles and the tears. Yet a part of me will always belong to London. The opportunity to be a part of life in London is the nectar in my jar, the honey in the FL hour, and the rainbow in the storm. As long as I have a taste of that nectar on a regular basis, I have found strength to salute life and live it with laughter and humor. I am like the migrating bird with her freedom to spend the winter months away and the summer at home. The hybrid. Nurtured and fed by two cultures, aware of both the joy of the ING accepted and the pain of rejection. Trying to remember to live life one day at a time and to accept who I am. Hoping to rise up to the struggle and challenge of doing so against a sea of apathy and rejection. Living, hoping and believing that there is a better tomorrow. Finally free to be me.